Hi everyone, I welcome you all to Edureka's YouTube channel, your one-stop solution for trending technologies. And today I'm here to give you a quick overview of the Spring Framework full course. Now Spring Framework is a powerful lightweight application development framework. It is one of the most popular Java-based framework which is mostly used for enterprise Java application development. Now the main reasons behind its popularity are its simplicity, testability and loose coupling. Now considering its demand in the market, we have come up with the Spring Framework full course which consists of 6 modules. Now the first module is a general introduction to Spring Framework and its various features. And in the second module, you will be diving deeper into Spring and understand its architecture and various fundamental concepts. Then in the third module, we will understand an important concept which is the aspect oriented programming. Now moving on to the fourth module, we will talk about the dependency injection and in the fifth module, we will have a look at the Spring MVC architecture. And finally, in the sixth module, we will discuss some basic questions that you might come across in your Spring Framework interviews. Now, this was all about today's agenda, but before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to Edureka's YouTube channel and press the bell icon for more updates. Also, if you are looking for an online certification in Spring, check out the description box below. Hello friends, so very warm welcome. This is uh, Ishan on behalf of Edureka. So I'm going to take on to something known as Spring Framework for the day and I hope you will enjoy the session. So let's just start. So what's the agenda for the day? So guys, we're going to understand the Java frameworks for the day, right? And thereafter, we'll jump on to Spring Framework and we'll understand why we need Spring Framework and what exactly it is. Thereafter, we'll also understand the architectural uh, part of Spring Framework and we'll try to discuss a few modules available in the Spring Framework. We'll also see what and all are the various features associated with the Spring Framework and we'll try to do one code on Spring Framework. So let's... Uh, start with the Java framework. So what exactly are the Java frameworks for us? So guys, we know uh, what exactly is Java, right? So it's a programming language which is supposed to help us solve a particular problem, right? And frameworks are nothing but they are the predefined APIs which we can embed in our programs, right? So let's see. So when as a developer we are writing, so we need to write a lot of code and many a time when the projects are in a deadline, so we are dependent on libraries to accomplish our projects in time, right? So these libraries are nothing but they are the frameworks or they are the APIs, right? So uh, as a developer, you shouldn't be bothered about, you know, writing a lot of code. So as of now, you can see, right? So, so much of code. So as a developer, we are pretty much tense about it. So need something that is fast and efficient. Now that's where we are gonna talk of Java frameworks or we're going to talk of the APIs, that's like application programming interfaces, which we need to put into our programs. So here's the solution. So I can use Java framework and using the Java frameworks, it's going to be very easy for us to achieve our targets and our deadlines in time, right? So uh, this fits with my code too, right? And whatever the frameworks you're going to choose. So we, we got a lot of frameworks, a lot of APIs available in Java now. So as per our requirement, we need to choose. For example, let's say that I want to search in PDF or I want to generate an Excel uh, report. So I need not write a Java IO API. So I, I need not to write my own Java IO code. So I can use the predefined libraries, right? So like uh, iText or write PDF, uh, you know, available libraries and I can do my task very easily. So the problem is solved, right? Whenever you start using the frameworks or when you start using the predefined code snippets in your programs. Now, what's the key benefit of having all these things, right? So my application speed and efficiency is also increased because the frameworks or the APIs, they are written in such a way that they are very well optimized. So we are looking on to a point now Right, so we started from a confused state and uh, we have reached to our potential state where we have to meet our project deadlines and all, right? So guys, the key target should be to use the frameworks as much as it is feasible and it is possible in our programming structures, right? You shouldn't be writing the code from the scratch. So in a smart world, if we are writing the programs from the scratch, right, it's not gonna help us, right? So always try to rely on the frameworks as possible as all right. 
So Java Frameworks principle, what exactly uh, the Java Framework principle is all about, right? So it abides the Hollywood principle that is uh, don't call us, we will call you. So it's basically inversion of uh, control which we are talking about. So uh, what exactly this key principle states like? So we got some class, right, for which we will create the object traditionally. So what is happening over here? So you create a class, you write down a class and then you create an object. But we are trying to talk of inversion of control, which says that do not worry about creating the object. So frameworks gonna create objects for you. You just configure the objects now, right? So let's say if we have a, a class A, which is having a dependency on some other classes like B and C, right? Or you can say it is the other way around, right? So if B and C are dependent on A or A is dependent on B and C. So how we can solve such problems? So Spring Framework is one of the key framework, right? Which focuses on inversion of control with the key principle as a dependency injection, right? So that's what we're gonna discuss. So the traditional way of constructing the Java object is by the developer, but the Java framework principle or the spring framework principle will state that you don't worry about constructing the object. Objects will be constructed by the frameworks itself. All right, so let's see various different Java frameworks available in the market. So guys, we have a lot of frameworks available in the market, right? To uh, name a few, so Hibernate, Struts and Spring, these are quite uh, famous frameworks available in the market. So JSF Play, Maven, we got a lot of frameworks now, right? These are some of the most importantly and widely used frameworks in the industry. So we are typically going to focus on Spring Framework. So let's see that. So what is Spring Framework and what exactly are its key features? So let's now switch on to that. So guys, Spring has been available on SourceForge and it's available since January 2003. So it's basically an open source project and it was introduced by the guy Rod Johnson, if you can see this guy, right? So the first version was released in the February 2003. And uh, so till that, right? So Spring is available as an open source community. You can always uh, browse the spring.org and you can browse its APIs, you can browse its documentation and you can learn a lot. So over the passage of years, right? So we got 4.3 as in the latest version in 2016, right? So this is widely used uh, version in the Spring framework. Let's now understand the definition of the Spring Framework. So Spring is one complete and a modular framework for developing the enterprise applications in Java, right? So guys, when we talk of Spring as a framework, right, it's a Java framework, but it is an enterprise edition Java framework. So what is meant by this term enterprise edition, right? So whenever we are writing the applications for the enterprises, let's take an example of an enterprise. So Amazon is an enterprise now, right? Google is an enterprise. So when we are supposed to solve the problems associated with the enterprises, we use the Spring Framework. All right. So Spring Framework can be used for all the layer implementations for a real-time application, right? So when I'm talking about the layer, so let's try to keep it very simple. Let's say model view controller architecture, right? So we got a Spring MVC as a design pattern, which you can use to completely construct all the layers in your application. So Spring can be used for the development of particular layer as well. So if you are not uh, interested in writing all the code in your Spring framework, you can also write few of the layer codes. Let's see some features associated with the Spring framework. The first thing it is open source, right? So it means that you can anytime have an access to the code and you can manipulate it and you can use it as in your own domain, right? So let's say I want to write a hospital management system on an enterprise level, right? And I need to use the Spring framework so I can manipulate the framework and I can try to manipulate the APIs which fits into my key domain itself. So we got comprehensive tools available in our Spring framework, right? It's lightweight when we talk of uh, the memory part, right? So it's very much relevant in solving the problems because it follows the design patterns and it effectively solves all the problems that we face in our enterprise edition of Java. So we typically say that Spring Framework is basically a framework of frameworks. Now why framework of frameworks? Because you can use a lot of frameworks within the Spring Framework itself. For an instance, if you want to do object relationship mapping using Hibernate, 
So Hibernate can be integrated or it is already there. It's already there. So we got the API through which we can directly access Hibernate, right? So that's why we say it's basically framework of frameworks. So uh, it avails array of resources. So we got a lot of resources starting from the very scratch. Let's say I want to implement security in my application or I want to implement something known as a model view controller or any other thing guys, right? So it's basically an array of resources. So you can avail a lot of features within the Spring Framework itself. Even the support like unit testing is also available in the Spring Framework itself. All right, so why we need to use Spring Framework? I think the previous discussed features, they are quite relevant that why we should be using Spring Framework. But let's try to understand it in more detail. So guys, uh, these are the relevant usages across the industry, right? So we got different, different frameworks available in the market. But if you can see the Spring MVC, so it's outshining all the other frameworks in the market, industrial, right? So it means that it is industrially adopted and it is quite, you know, robust and all the industry, all the companies, they love development in Spring Framework and it is really popular. Now there are reasons that why it is so popular. So it's simple now. So if you talk of uh, the simplicity level, so there are three basically main reasons out here now. The simplicity is the first level, right? The writing of code is very easy in the Spring Framework, right? Because here you are trying to configure the things and you are not trying to write the major portion of your code. You are, you are trying to configure the things. Then we got testability, right? And a loose coupling. So these are some of the other key concerns. And uh, let's now discuss them one by one. So when I talk of simplicity, so here you are always focused on writing your business objects as in Pojo or model or beans, right? So what is Pojo? Pojo is plain old Java object. So you are supposed to write your Java object definition in the form of class in your programs, right? So it's Pojo or Poji. So when I'm talking about plain old Java object in a similar way, we got interfaces now, right? So you can also write interfaces which will help us to get to our definitions to be implemented by us. Then we got something known as testability. So Spring Framework is already having the testing layers available. For example, we got JUnit already integrated. So you can always perform a unit test or an integration test as per your requirement, right? So this is uh, something where we can write our own test cases and we can test our own code, right? So this is one also great feature which is available in the Spring Framework. Then we got loose coupling. So here we are trying to understand that Spring objects are loosely coupled. Now, uh, for this, first of all, we must understand what is meant by the term coupling and what is uh, this loose coupling all about, right? So consider that you got a class uh, rider, right? And we got a bike. So uh, this bike over here, the reference to the bike object is basically initialized in the set bike method, right? So we got this interface bike available and we have a start method. So we got various classes like Honda, Bajaj or Yamaha, right? So which can implement the interface bike and they will have a method like start now, right? And we can anytime at runtime set the bike to either be Honda or Bajaj or Yamaha. So runtime polymorphic concept over here is implemented in a very beautiful way. And it ultimately takes us to something known as loosely coupled environment. So let's try to uh, discuss this as one example that how loosely coupled concept comes into action. Let's say I got one class as in rider. Correct. Okay? And we got one more class as in bike. Now if rider has a reference to bike and I am going to create one constructor for the rider where I am going to create an object of bike, right? So object of bike is constructed when object of rider shall be constructed. Now that is uh, the true reality over here. So if I'm trying to say that I will come up in the main. So if I'm trying to create the object of rider over here. So when I am creating the object of rider as of now, so the moment the rider constructor will be executed, your bike object will be constructed. It means that there exists a dependency of your bike object construction on the rider object construction, right? So this is like a high in coupling. So we got a high coupling over here. Now I need to reduce it. In order to reduce it, what I will do, I will just come down and I will create one function like set bike and I will write 
the reference over here in this fashion, right? So I'm gonna say this dot b assign b. So it means that now you don't do the concept out here. So rather than you create the object over here in the main. Now the construction of bike object is not dependent on the constructor of the rider, right? So that's one key concern over here. So what I will do, I will just say R dot set the bike to be B, right? So this is where we are trying to reduce coupling, right? And I will say that it is low coupling. So guys, this is where we will be reducing the coupling. So when I am talking of the spring framework, so spring framework will focus on always writing the code so that it is loosely coupled, right? So loose coupling concept with the runtime polymorphism, it brings a charm in your code as in design pattern. So what exactly is the ecosystem of the spring framework? So guys, we got a web layer, right? And we got a common layer, service layer and a data layer. So these are the different layers available in the spring framework ecosystem. So uh, we got the web layer, right? And it's basically the spring IO platform, right? And thereafter we got a common layer where we do some uh, basic operation as in spring boot, right? And thereafter we got service layers and the data layers available, right? As in the spring XT and the other, uh, you know, components available in the spring framework, right? So this is like uh, the entire spring framework ecosystem, how the spring framework's gonna come up and uh, interact and it is available in various modules available. So let's see the architectural part of the spring framework. So guys in the architectural part of the spring framework, we got the base layer as the testing layer available, right? So it's a layered architecture now. So spring architecture is a layered architecture. So the testing layer is basically uh, focusing on the J unit part, right? So where we can write the unit testing. Then we got the core container. So core container of the spring framework includes beans, core context and spring expression language. So this is the major and the main layer of your spring framework. Right, so here we got inversion of control and dependency injection, which is used in the upper layers even, right? And this forms the core part of your spring framework. So on top of core container, we got AOP aspects, instrumentation and messaging. So AOP is basically aspect oriented programming. So with the aspect oriented programming, we try to focus on cross cutting concerns. So what is meant by this uh, term cross cutting concern? Cross cutting concern is a concern which is a kind of a security now. So security has to be taken care in all the modules whenever you are writing the project, right? So aspect oriented programming helps us in implementing the cross cutting concerns. Now. Thereafter, we got data access integration layer with the help of which we will be able to access our, our databases, right? Or you can say where we got our data sets available. We got a web container over here where we can write the spring MVC web application, right? So we can have servlets, then portlets, which are the standalone applications over the web interfaces itself. So let's see the modules. So the spring module, basically it contains a lot of features and they are quite well organized and we got somewhere around 20 modules available, right? So the modules are grouped up and they are based on their few of the features as in the following, right? So as in the layered architecture we discussed, so in a similar way, we got these frameworks available. So we got core container, data access or integration, right? So you can access the data sets or uh, you can uh, have integrations with the frameworks like Hibernate or so. So core container will be the one which is the basic functionality. So using the web layer or the web APIs, we can write the web MVC code, then aspect oriented programming, the way we got object oriented programming in a similar way, we got aspect oriented programming. So here we are trying to fulfill the cross cutting concerns. Then we got instrumentation and the testing layers. Let's talk about the modules one by one. So when we are talking about the core part of the spring framework, so we got a core container which focuses on dependency injection and inversion of control. So the core layer provides the fundamental parts for the framework. So these are the base of the spring framework now, right? So we got something known as beans, context and spring expression language. So these are the three important uh, key concerns, right? So guys, beans are nothing but uh, they are the Java objects which are constructed by the spring framework. So you need to configure them. Then we got context. It's an implementation of the beans itself. Right. So it supports internationalization, for example, EJB, JMS or uh, remote APIs if you want to come up with that. 
then spring expression language is an expression language with the help of which we can uh, write programs even the data access modules of the spring framework will be able to access the data sets right so if you have the data available in the database let's talk about we got an oracle as a database right and we need to interact with the oracle and we can do so very easily with the spring framework so we got a jdbc layer we got orm layer so that's like these are all integration layers so orm is like object relationship mapping for example the hibernate so we got these integration layers which we can use then we got basically an object to xml mappings available then java messaging services are available then transaction management is also available right so if you are going to fire a transaction so commit and roll back all all these supports are available within your data access module itself so guys over the web layer we are trying to understand something known as a model view controller based web application right so the main uh, industrial usage over the web is web mvc module right so that's like uh, one of uh, the major modules which is quite readily used in the spring framework and it is industrially accepted so we got something known as web oriented features right we got portlets and sockets so portlets are nothing but they are the stand alone applications which are running in a web application right and there after we got uh, web sockets in order to come up with a two way communication so the few miscellaneous modules which are available in the spring framework includes aop right so aop is where you are going to fulfill the cross cutting concerns then we got instrumenting where we provide the class instrumentation support and class loader implementation we got aspects right so aspects are nothing but it provides the integrations with the aspect j and aspect j is something where we gonna fulfill the cross cutting concerns exactly where then we got uh, messages right and the testing layer so guys in case you want to come up with the unit testing so we got uh, support with the help of components like j unit or test ng so these are again the framework so that's why we call uh, spring framework as a framework of frameworks now let us understand how the spring framework will flow so guys the very first component in the spring framework is inversion of control right so we need to uh, come up slowly and slowly so that we can reach up to the end point so the first component is inversion of control let's see that so what exactly is the inversion of control so traditionally when we are writing the program so we will create the object right so that's like uh, you come up and you create the object so once the object is constructed right so we need to uh, wire them together so let's say we got multiple objects now and they have a dependency in between let's take our previous example as in uh, bike and rider example right so rider will have a bike so now we need to uh, you know fulfill this dependency somehow so we need to configure them in spring framework what we do we configure them and thereafter so whole management of the life cycle of the objects is taken care by the spring framework itself so we don't worry on that part so guys we'll try to code this flow and understand that how this uh, flow will exactly work all right so what and all uh, are the other concerns related with the ioc container so guys the spring ioc container by using the java pojo classes and configuration metadata produces a fully configured and an executable system or an application right so what we are trying to say is that you come up with the pojo class you write the pojo class and you provide the metadata in the form of some xml configuration you give it to the spring framework or the spring container and it will automatically give us the objects which we can use directly in our application or you can say we got a ready to use application itself so uh, let's see what exactly are the ioc containers so we got two different apis which are the ioc containers in the spring framework one is the bean factory other one is the application context so bean factory is basically an interface and application context is an implementation of bean factory itself so it is always better to come up and use application context so what happens over here these containers will basically load the xml files and thereafter they gonna construct the objects for us so we can also do by constructing by writing the annotations in our pojo classes itself if you want to skip xml you can come up with the annotational model so that is also supported now after the inversion of control we got dependency injection now dependency injection is all about when we have dependency in our code right so spring framework uh, has this di technique where we can remove the dependency from our code right so it's gonna make our application quite easy and manage to use and most importantly our programming code becomes loosely coupled right so that's 
the key important point which we need to take care even when we are writing the code examples all right so how this dependency injection is taken care by the spring framework so in the spring framework we got by constructor and by setter method so these are the two different techniques right by which the dependency injection is resolved right so we got a constructor arg and a property as key tags which can help us to resolve this dependency injection then next is the aop that's like aspect oriented programming so aspect oriented programming is basically where we need to implement cross cutting concerns right so i'll just try to take up one example of a cross cutting concern right so consider that we logged on to amazon and we we want to look on to a product right so i search for an iphone so the moment i started searching the iphone and i'm browsing the different different iphones in the same category that's like apple iphone so amazon will record from what time i started surfing the iphones and what time i left surfing the iphone so based on that amazon can give me some promotional offers or i can get some you know emails or i can get some advertisements from the amazon which will say that you must purchase this iphone right so logging now logging is also a kind of a cross cutting concern to implement such cross cutting concerns we can use aspect oriented programming in the spring framework so it gives us lot of other things right so as in the number one it's going to provide the modularity then aop will break the program into the distinct parts called concerns it also increases the modularity right when we write these cross cutting concerns and a cross cutting concern is a concern which can affect the entire application right for example security is one of the major cross cutting concerns right so we must be implementing them in a proper and in a regular way all right so uh, have a look guys uh, so in a cross cutting concern so if we have a different different modules and if we got couple of layers for example model view and controller so we need to implement these cross cutting concerns in every module and in every stage right let's say security so if i am writing a very basic code and i am trying to come up with the last level of my code i need to make sure and i need to ensure that security always remains so the last component or the last important concern which we have to discuss over here is a model view controller as in the spring framework right so guys uh, what happens over here when we are writing any enterprise application or a web application or if you try to write any software product right so model view controller is one design pattern so in this design pattern what happens the user will send a request over the presentation layer right so this request can be on to a presentation layer that's like a user interface so it is typically a view right so request will go from the view to the controller and controller is that guy which will process the request from the client or from the user right so typically the client over here is acting as a browser now correct so let us try to understand if i am going to search an iphone in the amazon right so when the amazon website is open it's the presentation layer we call it a view when i'm searching the iphone and when i click on the search so this request goes to a controller which will process from the data set so model represents the data set over here right so we'll get the data from the data set into the controller right and controller can give it back to the view and this can be sent back as a response to the user so model view controller as a design pattern so what we need to focus we need to write the model separately controller separately and view separately so spring mvc as a complete uh, one package helps us to write minimal of code because it's all uh, you know modeled as a framework itself for us right so you need to write minimal code and you just need to write your own business logics and everything else will be taken care by the spring mvc flow all right so let's summarize the entire part so guys we got java frameworks we got spring framework why spring frameworks the architecture part of the spring frameworks what are various modules available in the spring framework and few of the spring features which we have discussed right so now let's try to uh, come down and see one snippet over the spring framework right so i'm going to write one java application so let's try to write one java application and uh, let's see how we can come up with our spring framework example so let's say it's one spring edureka 
demo and I'm gonna finish the project. So here we are with the Spring Edureka demo. Now what I am going to do over here is I'm going to write one new class and I'm going to write the class name as employee. So let's try to take one package as co.edureka and let's finish it off. Now I want this employee class should be a Pojo class. So I'm going to write one employee ID. Let's uh, write one employee name and let's also try to write some employee salary. So if you want to come up, you can come up with some more data, right? So these are the attributes for my object, which I have mentioned in our class, right? And thereafter, I need to define constructors, getters and setters to come up with the POJO structure, right? So let's say right click source generate constructor using fields. So this is one constructor along with all the fields. So I'm also going to construct one constructor as in a default one. So let's try to write one default constructor. I got uh, one constructor with all the inputs and the lastly I'm going to do it as generate getters and setters. Let's select all. So here we are with the getters and setters and now I'm also going to write one two string method. So let's generate one two string method. So this is one structure which is representing uh, POJO or model or bean, right? So call it as a POJO or a model or a bean structure, right? So once I am done with this, what I will do next is that I'll write one client class. So I'm going to write one class as in client along with the main map, right? So this is my main method. So what is the traditional way as a developer, how I will construct the objects, right? So I will say employee as in a new employee, right? And thereafter, I'll say e dot set of EID as 101 e dot set of employee name as in, let's say John Watson. And finally, I will set a salary, let's say 30,000, right? So this is the traditional way how you will construct an object. So other than that, all right, so I think uh, I did something wrong. All right, so I, I have uh, taken the salary as in string. So guys, uh, let me uh, change it to the integer part. Just a moment. So here we are done. Now I will just say CSO and I will try to print the E. So what I will get as in response, I will be getting the response as in the details of the employee. Now, this is my traditional way how we construct the objects in Java. Let's try to follow the spring framework and let's see how we can come up with inversion of control, right? So I'm going to write something known as inversion of control, right? So IOC as in spring framework. So let's see how we can do that. To do that, I'll follow certain steps. The step number one will be to add jar files for core, I'll just say for spring core, right? So let's add jar files for spring core, right? Number two, configure Java object in an XML file, right? And number three, use spring container, spring IOC container, so when we are saying IOC container, for example, bean factory or application context to get the objects constructed by them. So we now need to follow these three simple steps to perform the first fundamental that's like inversion of control. We add the jar files for Spring Core and thereafter we're going to configure the Java objects in an XML file and finally we'll use the Spring IOC container, for example, bean factory or application context so that we can get the objects constructed by the Spring container itself, right? So let's see how we can do that. So step number one, I'm going to configure uh, my project with the build path with the Spring Core jar files. So I'm going to say build path, configure the build path. And in my build path configuration, I'm going to add the external jars under the libraries. So here we are with the spring jar. So I already have my core jars available over here, right? So you can download it over the web. So I'm just going to link these jar files with my project structure and let's say apply and okay. 
So here we are with the Spring Core jar files available in my project, right? So once I am done with this, so the next part is to come up with one XML configuration file. So let me take up to that. So just a moment. So I'll just copy one of the employee bean dot XML file. So I have this XML file and I'm going to copy it in my SRC directory. If you will see, I'm not copying it to my package. I'm copying it into the SRC directory out here, right? So once we are done uh, with the copying of this XML file, let's try to open and see the structure of this XML file now. So the structure of the XML file says that it's basically one root tag known as beans with the tag known as beans and the property. So what is this bean ID all about? So ID can be any name of your choice. For example, I'm going to say this is MP1 and the class over here goes like code edureka dot employee the property is uh, the attribute names available in your pojo structure eid e name and e salary right so i got eid so for my eid the value goes like one or two right and similarly i got e name and e salary so in lower case i think let me just cross check right so it's all in lower case so e name goes like jenny and e salary goes like let's say 50000 so this is my one of the beans so i can declare as many as uh, object configurations over here right so let's try to come up with some m2 and let's say this is 103 this is jack with 46 right so these are the two configurations which i have done in the xml file so the first thing was to link the jar file. Second thing was to configure the concept of my objects as in key value pairs. So key are attribute names and the value is the exact value which the object will hold for its attribute. So this is the state of an object now, right over here. Now what is next? So the next part is to use the spring container in my client class. So use the spring IOC container. So I'm going to use the application context out here. Right, so let's see how we can use the application context. So you say application context, if you can see over here. So application context, context as in a new class path XML application context, and you mention over here employee bean dot XML. So guys, this name of the file can be any name of your choice, right? You are free to use any name. But make sure that this employee bean.xml file is available under the SRC directory, right? So here we got employee bean.xml file, right? And that too within the application context. So now I will say employee e1 as in context dot get the bean you mention as m1. So what we are doing, we are using the API known as get bean. So this m1 we gave it in our xml configuration right so over here i'll just uh, downcast it as in employee because it's gonna return me the object right so we need to uh, downcast or the other way of uh, using the same guy is like you say m2 as in context dot get the b m2 and you just mention the class over here like this and now let's say see so e1 and CISO of E2, right? So here I'm just gonna put a delimiter spring IOC in action, right? So this is one delimiter. Let's run the code and see the output. So guys, now we can see the traditional way of retrieving the objects was you construct the objects, you set the data, right? And the spring framework says that you don't create the objects you use the objects in your program and now what is the beauty about this xml file coming into over here so many times we'll be confused right so why we are doing all these stupid stuff right the reason is that xml over here can be changed anytime right and you need not to worry about changing the source code so it's not the kind of a source code right so xml file is not a source code which will be compiled into some binary and then binary will be processed by JVM. So JVM is processing the Java files as in the byte codes. So this XML file is not a part of your source, right? So it's gonna be modified at any time, whenever and as required by us, right? So here the configuration goes in the XML file.
so the real implementation of the same inversion of control can be seen in the android right so let me uh, you know run down with one example over here so where this inversion of control fits into so let's see that part so how the spring framework is related to the android let's try to come up and uh, understand this part so it's a very beautiful concept the inversion of control which we have demonstrated over here right so let me try to open any of the applications over here all right so let the system gets uh, loaded for us so even though it's exactly you know out of our context but it's just for the reference purpose right so we'll now see that there is something known as uh, these layout files which are all the xml files if you can see over here so these are different xml files and in these xml files i can see that uh, we got some uh, you know configurations done out here right so these are the properties now so what is the menu it's a drawer menu right so what is the weight what is the height so for every you know android ui part so we got this configuration available in the xml file right so any time user can actually come down and change the xml file structure so the code will not be affected so what android will do android will read this xml files and it's going to construct the java objects its inversion of control which is available so in my board if you can see over here right so the ui is exactly uh, dependent if you can see the same xml file structures right and we are trying to say find view by id so let's try to understand this so here you can see the toolbar coming up right so as in some toolbar and here we are trying to say find view by id as in toolbar so it's a very much similar story as in we are trying to say context dot get bean right so the api standards are different so guys this is what we got as in spring ioc right and the introduction to the spring framework we're going to represent uh, the spring framework tutorial now so hope you will enjoy it so let's see what and all we have in our spring framework tutorial today so what's going to be the agenda we'll understand why we need the frameworks in java and what exactly a java framework is so thereafter we shall be proceeding towards spring framework now that's where we're going to uh, focus on we'll see what spring framework why we need spring framework and various modules available in the spring we shall be focusing practically on inversion of control that's like ioc container which is the core of the spring module we'll see what are beans and we'll also see what is meant by dependency injection so why java frameworks so guys uh, there are various problems associated with the enterprise edition of java right so when you talk about the technology it becomes complex when we are writing the enterprise uh, applications so to name a few we got a lookup problem so when you going to do lookup right so you going to face the problems and on the memory front again the optimizations are not done properly right so we got heavyweight components and uh, they're going to focus more on memory part so we need to know java frameworks which are basically a collection of uh, classes we say a collection of apis it's a predefined code which you can use in your programs to solve some specific problem right so how the things going to work over here so we got large bodies of predefined code available with us right we can also call them apis so framework is nothing it's a set of apis uh, so if you talk on the code part so it's nothing it's a byte code right the class is available for us to be utilized so what we need to do we need to add this uh, snippet or this predefined api in our program right so that we can solve a problem for a specific domain right so that's how you're going to come up with your api usage now what can be the advantages of java framework the first thing is efficiency right so we want uh, a security we want less expenses and a support right now all these features so they are an expectation at the developer end right so when you are writing the code if you are using the framework if you are using the predefined code so all these features you need to uh, relax now on these all four fronts right so the code which you are going to use it will be efficient right it's going to be secure so you need not to uh, pay for it because most of the java frameworks they are open source right and you just need to use them you just need to include it into your program as a dependency and then you uh, finally use it right 
other than that support in the form of documentation or uh, even uh, you know in the form of various uh, stack overflow threads coming in so it's it's going to be very easy for us to manage uh, any problem which we have so there are various disadvantages even the associated with the java framework right so the number one is you got a restriction then the code is public and finally the custom built features let's understand that point now so we are restricted to use an api the way it is so you can't modify it now that's the whole scenario if you want to use an api in your own different way right you can't do that so we are restricted to use the same api let's say that one of the method it's taking three inputs and you are supposed to have a method which can do the same task with only one input so you can't do that now it's a limitation right so there are restrictions the code is public it means that if you are going to use any of the api what's going to happen the same api is exposed to the public let's say you are supposed to use an open source api which is doing an encryption and decryption for you right so it's going to be very much uh, you know challenging for us to maintain that kind of a security then the custom built features so if you have apis you can write your code but the thing is whatever the api is written so what is the language or the technology behind the api so many times that will not be exposed to the developer right so specifically in case it's a web service you might not know what is the internals of that api so that's what the encapsulation is all about right and here you face a challenge again so we got various java frameworks available now right there are a lot of frameworks available so frameworks is nothing it's a set of apis so you got jsf maven hibernate start play spring etc 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 guys a lot of java frameworks are available in the market so specifically we are supposed to uh, discuss on spring framework right so there is a web development team of some xyz company with this group of six members and it's uh, harried by uh, the manager harry right so he's the lead of the team so harry has got a call from the management team with some urgent requirement now right so he's having an urgent requirement to be implemented and to be delivered to the client somehow so team we got one request from the client that we need to write an application but the challenge is that we have got very little time frame to finish off this project now this is one challenge which as a developer or as a development company we're going to face it for sure so clients whenever they're going to come they're going to come up with the first thing as we have very less time right when they have less time we need to uh, perform the end product to the client so we need to rely on the framework somehow so if we go by the general way it's going to take a lot of time in writing the unnecessary code right it's going to take a lot of time so we need something that's fast flexible and efficient so it's not only that we're going to use a framework but we also need to consider more of the parameters so that's like you should have an efficient code which you can integrate and you can write an application with right so in case we need to use any framework now ria says let's let's use uh, any framework over here so ali says we can go for struts then someone says we can go for hibernate so guys these are all uh, java frameworks more or less right so finally ria says that we can use spring framework now why specifically spring framework because uh, it outshines the other frameworks in a way that it's a framework of frameworks now so it provides us the flexibility as well as we got model view controller architecture right so spring mvc is basically a uh, based on interfaces so the way we got struts and hibernate so they are not all the interfaces but you need to use the objects and uh, classes whatever we have so in spring framework specifically in the mvc what we got we got interfaces so that we can write our own implementation now that's the benefit right so we got interface we just use it we write the way we want to create the implementation of that interface so this way you won't affect the client side even all right so scott says uh, let's have a discussion on spring framework so how it's going to solve our problem right so so guys spring framework increases the efficiency of the application so it's going to be optimized so the code is optimized so it's going to reduce the overall application development time since it's a framework right we need to use the apis so it's going to help us in our development time so we can easily finish our project in the given time frame now that's where 
we try to fit in the spring. So that's really nice. Let's proceed with the spring then. So guys, let's see what is uh, spring framework, right? And what it is all about. So uh, there are a lot of features, uh, if you can see now, right? So it's an open source framework. It's a lightweight application framework. It means that it's uh, less on memory. So the objects constructed in the memory, so they're gonna take uh, less space and it's efficient, it's optimized. So overall code complexity is also reduced over here. And we got various tools associated with the Spring Framework which you can use. We call Spring Framework as Framework of Frameworks. So what we can do now, over here, we can integrate the Hibernate code with the Spring code and we can use it in our application even. Right, so we got various tools. It's an array of resources which is available to us and we can just use and we can concentrate only on writing our business logic rather than focusing on writing some unnecessary code so spring was released in the february 2003 right it's available on sourceforge and the guy rod johnson is behind the spring framework right so this guy did the spring framework now spring framework has an ecosystem if you see onto the spring framework right so we got a web layer the common layer the service layer and the data layer. so we got uh, various modules coming in to our spring framework ecosystem so we got spring io platform then we got a Spring Boot and we got a Spring XD. So that's like the foundation layer, right? So if you can see now, so how from web layer to the common layer to the service layer to the data layer, how are we gonna access it? So everything, we got everything now. We got from Spring Data, Spring Cloud, right? We got a lot of things now. So Spring is a kind of a framework which is basically an ecosystem starting from mobile apps to the web apps. You can fit it in anywhere, right? So that's a pretty good ecosystem which is available to the developer so why we should be using spring framework right so that was something about spring framework so there is some industrial usage of the spring framework over the other framework so it's 40% uh, as compared to the other frameworks if you will see that so this is on uh, top of it right so this is industrially spring framework is used uh, uh, very widely rather than the other frameworks if you can see uh, this uh, slab coming up right so spring framework is maximum with 40% now why so so guys number one distinct division between java bean models controllers and view so uh, what i'm trying to say over here is that spring is basically an mvc architecture so model view and controller so all these three are the different different uh, uh, divisions right so we can say it's an architectural design pattern which is followed by the spring framework one of the most popular design pattern right so it's very flexible mvc is very flexible as it makes the use of interfaces so here we use interfaces so that we can write the implementation as per our requirement so nothing like uh, you know restriction coming up over here then spring mvc web tiers are typically easier to test we also got testing uh, modules available in the spring framework itself so j unit and all is uh, available so we can use the testing frameworks then well-defined interface towards the business layers spring controllers are configured via inversion of control so guys there is something known as ioc which is the core of the spring framework we're going to understand it practically what exactly this term ioc is other than that offers better integration with view technologies other than jsp so let's say I want to integrate, uh, uh, you know, JSP with the JDBC. I, I want to use JDBC code in my JSP, right? So one way is typically uh, the developers, they're going to follow the uh, basic approach. They're going to write all the uh, sequential steps and they're going to do it. Other than that, we're going to use a design pattern. For example, uh, the DAO and the DTO, right? You're going to use the design patterns and through which you will be able to access the JDBC. So what Spring Framework will do? Spring Framework is already having the integration APIs which follows the perfect design patterns so that it becomes uh, scalable, robust, modularity of your code is going to enhance, right? So all these kind of integrations, we got the APIs available within the Spring Framework itself. So you need not to uh, worry again on writing the core uh, code, right? And you need not to worry even about the design pattern. So it, it is already based on the design pattern somehow. All right, 
So let's try to compare Spring Stats and Hibernate. Even though Hibernate is a entirely backend framework, uh, where Spring and Stats they do different jobs, but let's try to have a, a differentiation. So the first thing is that Spring is an application framework, right? It's lightweight, layered architecture, and loose coupling. So when we say loose coupling, it means that less dependency of one module on the other modules, right? So just imagine that we are supposed to, uh, you know, uh, reserve a flight and we need to use a flight reservation system. And if that web service goes down due to any of the module failure, so there will be a very big loss to the airline company. So coupling of one module over the other module should be as least as possible. So you need to have loose coupling. So Spring Framework by default is uh, designed in a way that it has, it facilitates loose coupling more or less. So there's nothing like tag library. So it's basically, it's an application framework, but it has no tag library. So it's all about interfaces and the implementation of the interfaces. So very easily you can integrate the ORM technology. So you can integrate Hibernate, Ibatis, anything you can integrate with the Spring framework very easily. Other than that, the client side technology integration is not that easy when you talk of Spring Framework, right? So, so these are some of uh, the key differences when you have Spring versus the Struts or the Hibernate. Now let's try to see what is the architecture of the Spring Framework. So guys, Spring Framework architecture has uh, various layers. Now it's a layered architecture, right? So the base layer is the testing layer. On top of the testing layer, we got the core container. So today we're gonna discuss on the Spring core container, right? We'll understand what are beans, what's uh, the core of the Spring framework that's like inversion of control. We're gonna focus on that part and we'll also see what is dependency injection. So the core container over here will have beans core context and uh, Spring expression language. And on top of core container, we got AOP layer. So that's like aspect oriented programming. So guys, aspect oriented programming is quite uh, analogous to object oriented programming so here what's happening your aspect oriented programming will focus on how we can implement the cross cutting concerns how we can implement the cross cutting concerns over here right so we're gonna understand the aop module in terms of how you can have a cross cutting concern which is a fulfilled using something known as aspects right so that's how we got aop Moving on, we got data access or integration layer. So here we're going to uh, deal with the ORM or the JDBC or, or your uh, backend part, right? The web module will focus on how you can write a web MVC application. So for example, the servlets or the portlets or the sockets or the web layer, right? So that's how you got various uh, layers available in the Spring architecture. All right, guys. So what and all are the modules? So we're going to uh, discuss the core module over here. So the core module or the core container is having four of uh, these major key concepts. The first is core. So that's like the fundamental part of the spring framework. Then we got the bean, which is provided with the help of a bean factory. So it's like uh, a container which is going to generate the bean. Bean is nothing. It's an object, guys, right? So it's an object. We got the context. It's a medium to access uh, any objects defined and configured. Then we got Spring Expression Language. So Spring Expression Language is one of the powerful expression language through which we can do a lot of stuff over here. Then we got Data Access. So as Data Access deals with the backend part, the database part, we got JDBC. So we got a JDBC abstraction layer which we can use. Then we got ORM. So ORM here, uh, Spring Framework will give us an integration layer so that you can have object relational mapping APIs. Then OXM is also there for any abstraction layer. We got messaging service so that we can consume and produce the messages. Then the transaction management, either it's programmatic or it's declarative, right? So it's also facilitated through Spring Framework's data access layer. The web layer has WebSocket, Servlet, Web and Portlet. So WebSocket is basically a support, right, based on a two-way communication between the client and the server. So servlet is again the core part of the enterprise edition. So here it contains the Spring's MVC implementation for the web application. And the web-oriented integration feature is also one of the key feature over here in the web part. Then portlets are nothing, but they are the standalone applications running on the web application, right? So it provides the MVC implementation 
and also mirrors the functionality of a web servlet module. We also have some uh, miscellaneous modules where AOP, that's like aspect oriented programming, which is uh, fulfilled with the help of aspects. Then we got instrumentation support and uh, how we can have class order implementations. Then the messaging support is available and the testing support is also available if you want to uh, uh, perform the testing, right? You can have unit testing available with the help of JUnit library. Right, so guys, uh, that was a bit of uh, theoretical introduction to the Spring Framework, right? So what we are going to do now is the first program in your Spring Framework, right? So let's see how we can write the first uh, program in the Spring Framework. So number one, you need to have an Eclipse ID, right? So you need to download the Eclipse ID and you need to install it. So once you do it, you need to do it from the Eclipse.org, right? So you download the Enterprise Edition of uh, Eclipse, go to the Help and go to the Eclipse Marketplace. So you need to select the Marketplace option. And from there, you just search for the Spring and here you will get the Spring ID. So the versions uh, might be different, right? So whatever the latest one, you, it will come automatically for you. So you, then you're gonna uh, click on this install button and Spring ID within the Eclipse ID will be plugged in, right? So we need to, first of all, uh, perform uh, this step so that you can make your Eclipse to be ready to write any Spring application. So for the further steps, you need to confirm and proceed, right? So once you click on the install button, you need to finish the installation and then you say confirm. So once the installation is finished, it's all next and uh, finished, right? So just restart the Eclipse, even though it's gonna ask you automatically, but you, if, if it is not, so restart the Eclipse and then you will be ready to code. Now, in order to code the application, we got five simple steps. The first one is you need to write a bean class, then, we need to have an XML file. Then there will be one main class that's gonna have the main method, right? Where you're gonna write your core logic. You need to load the jar files required for your Spring Core Framework. And finally you do the run on your project, right? So that's the, uh, uh, you know, sequential approach of writing our program, right? So guys, uh, let's try to focus on how we are going to perform this operation. So let's try to see that if there is a class known as employee, let's say that there is a class employee and for this class employee, I got an EID that's like employee ID and you got the employee name coming in. Let's try to say uh, the address of the employee, right? And we can also have what's uh, the gender of the employee. A lot of other things you can write over here, right? So what are these? These are nothing but these are the attributes. Right, so we got the attributes coming in over here. So other than that, we can have methods uh, of our choice. Now traditionally, so or you can say conventionally, how you write the object, right? So the object construction. So how you gonna construct the object? In order to construct the object, you will say employee, then the reference to the employee, and you create a new object of employee, right? So this is how you gonna create the object of employee. So it's a very basic to understand that traditionally, if you want to write an object of employee, it's very easy in Java. You just write the class name, a reference variable, then a new object, right? So this is a call to the constructor somehow. What I can do now, I can just say eref dot eid is 101, right? Then you say eref dot ename goes like John Watson. Then you can say eref dot address of employee it goes like uh, let's say redwood shoes and then finally you can have eref dot gender which goes like the mail now this is the traditional approach how you write the object what spring will do so spring has a core module right which follows inversion of control now what is meant by this term inversion of Control. Let's try to understand uh, this core concept, Spring IOC. So what Spring IOC says that you don't create objects, right? So you don't create objects now. Objects shall be configured in an XML file. So objects shall be configured in an XML file. 
by the developer right so there is one module known as spring container right so spring container will be responsible to construct the java objects by parsing xml file so you don't create the objects so objects will be constructed by the spring container by parsing the xml file so you need to mention the data which these attributes will store in an xml file right so that's what we call inversion of control so having the control over the object construction is given to the spring container right so what is the benefit of having such an object the benefit of having such an object is that your xml files they are not a part of source code right so you can configure you can anytime manipulate the values and your object will be constructed accordingly let's see that how we can do it in our project right so my eclipse is uh, already configured guys so i'm just going to write one uh, new java project let's start and let's see how we can do that part so i'm going to write one new java project and let's uh, name it like spring core demo and let's say next and let's uh, do a finish on it and now what i'm going to do i'm going to create one bean class right so let's say a new class so i'm going to write it within a package known as code.edureka and let the name of the class goes like employee and let's finish it up so here we are now what i'm going to do i'm going to write the same parameters eid then you got e name and let's have one employee address right so guys i'm just going to take uh, three of the attributes you can take uh, n number of attributes over here as per your choice so we have these many attributes now i'm going to write down the methods so methods typically are the constructors then the getters and the setters right so i'm going to write one employee constructor which is a default one right so it has uh, nothing over there then i'm going to write one parameterized constructor so i'm going to do a right click source generate a constructor using the fields over here if you can see right and say okay so here we are with the constructor along with the attributes now you can say a source and a generate of getters and setters you say select all you say okay and here we are with the getter setter methods and finally i'm going to generate a two string let's say generate a two string and say okay so here we are with the two string now such a class over here if you can see is referred to as a bean or model or pojo so pojo is like plain old java object right so plain old java object so basically here we don't have anything other than the attributes and the methods to write and to read into the attribute so that's like a bean or a model or a pojo so it has no business logic right so there is no business logic over here now what i'm going to do i'm going to write one more class and i'm going to write this class uh, as a client class with a main method so here we got a main method right and this is my client class with the main method so let's see the object construction so how we construct the objects so we going to say employee eref is a new employee right so i can say eref dot set of employee name as john watson then you can say eref dot set of employee id let's say 101 so guys uh, even though my attributes are you know uh, not private but i'm trying to just utilize the, the setters right so if, if they are private that makes some more sense of using the setters over here right so eref dot set of employee address so let's say it's gonna be like redwood shores and now when i'm gonna do a CSO on employee details and then let's try to say eref right so when i'm going to print eref it's gonna call the two string method right so when it's gonna call the two string method so you're gonna get these details from your employee right so let's run the code let's run it as a java application so here we can see over the console 
so you got uh, this output coming in right so employee details so eid is 101 name is john watson and address is redwood shows so who created the object now so object construction was done by us right so this was done by developer now what we want we want to do it in a spring way so what spring says right so spring way we are gonna implement ioc that's like inversion of control right so you're gonna say we need to use inversion of control so in order to use inversion of control over here we shall see how to write the spring apis and how to utilize them the very first thing is you need to add jar files so let's add jar files to add the jar files do a right click and then i'm gonna say build path configure the build path right so here we are with the libraries and i need to do add external jars so if you can see we got a spring code demo over here i did a right click i went to something known as build path configure the build path then you say libraries add external jars right so i'm gonna add the jar files and here i am with the spring core jar files over here right i'm gonna say open and then i'm gonna say apply and okay so here i am referenced with my spring core framework over here right so that's like my spring core framework now what's next over here in order to use my spring core framework i need an xml file so there were five simple steps right if you can recall so these were the five simple steps if you can recall we got a bean class so that's like employee we got a demo class that's like uh, the client we loaded the jar files and now we need an xml file right so i'm gonna copy my xml file so just give me a moment so we'll uh, just copy the xml file so i have this file known as employee bean dot xml file guys i'm just gonna do a control c and exactly within my src over here if you can see i'm gonna do a paste of it so i just copied and pasted one of the xml file uh, available over here right so nothing you know very complex which i have done it's very basic which we have done so far now let's open this employee bean dot xml file so the very first thing over here if you can see uh, it's an xml file with a root tag of beans and beans containing uh, one bean over here so i want to say the id of the bean over here is something like uh, emp and the class goes like co.edureka.employ right so i am going to give the reference over here and this is the class name so there will be some properties now so the property goes like eid e name and e address so these are the three properties available over here right if you can see eid e name and then e address so these three properties i have given over here eid e name and e address so for my eid the value goes like one or two for the e name it goes like uh, jenny and my e address i'm gonna write it as uh, let's say some southern shows so let's take some different address value over here now you can write more beans as of your choice right so let's say this is m1 this is m2 and uh, here it goes like 103 let's say jack let's say eastern right so these are you can say it's a configuration resource for my objects so i am just putting up the key value pair over here so key is the attribute name and the value is the exact value with the attribute holds let's come to the client let's see how we can write the spring way how we can do the inversion of control to do the inversion of control we'll write an api known as resource so it's like uh, from the spring framework if you can say it's an interface now right so uh, the third one resource resource is a new class path resource and here i'm just gonna give the name of employee being dot xml so if you can see now so what we have done we have given the name of this xml file over here right and thereafter i'm gonna say bean factory 
So again, we got an interface known as a bean factory over here. So bean factory, factory is a new XML bean factory from the resource. Now this is known as the spring core container, right? So bean factory is nothing. It's what? It's a spring container which shall read or which shall parse XML file and construct the objects. So we don't construct the objects now. So if you can see, so this was uh, the traditional way how we are writing the objects, but this is something the spring way, right? So now what I need to do, I need to say employee E1 is factory dot get the bean and you just mention the reference that's like emp1. So I want to uh, get the reference to the emp1. So I'm just writing this emp1 and if uh, you get it, so you need to do a type cast over here. Similarly, you can also try to get the second guy. You can say M E2 is uh, an employee. So rather than saying it in this way, I will use one more syntax. So I'll say a get bean. Here I'll mention uh, the M2, but the type goes here, right? So this is one more way of getting the reference to the object. So objects are constructed by the spring core container and you are just obtaining the reference to the object, right? So you do a CISO and you say employee one details plus E1, right? So it's going to call two string for you. Similarly, employee two details, it's going to go with the E2. Let's run the code, right? So guys, uh, here if you can see, so spring framework came into action. So details are now coming from the spring core container object. So object was constructed by the spring core container. You didn't create the object. So this was a traditional approach, how we write the object. And this is a spring approach, how we are getting the reference to the objects, right? So let's see it once more. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, just write a CISO statement in this. So I'm going to say employee object constructed, right? So we know how many objects are constructed. So one is constructed by us and two are constructed by the spring container. So when you run the code, you find that employee object constructed and two employee objects constructed out here, right? So let's try to comment this code over here. So we commented this code over here and we tried to run the code. And now we can see one difference. So you didn't gave a request to get the bean and the bean factory didn't create the object for you. So you have configured your XML bean resource file, but the objects are getting constructed when you request for them, right? So when you are requesting for them and now when you run the code over here, you will see that your objects are constructed. So object construction is happening with the spring framework and whatever the objects are being constructed through the spring framework, they get constructed when you request for them, right? So this is what we call as in the spring framework core layer where we got five simple steps to do it, right? So these are the five simple steps. So you need to write one bean class, then you must have an XML file right and in your program you need to use the spring way of doing it all right so now we got one more api if you can see over here application context as in new class path xml application context right so let's try to uh, understand one more spring container over here the first spring container is this uh, bean factory the next spring container is known as application context so application context over here is also one of uh, the core container in the spring framework which is used to do the inversion of control and it's basically an implementation of the bean factory right so you say a new class path xml application context and you mention your employee bean dot xml over here so uh, the way you were saying factory dot get of bean right so here what we were doing was we were doing factory dot get of bean so rather than saying factory i will say context 
So that's one difference, right? And now you run the code again, you get the same output, right? So you get the same output now. But there is one fundamental difference over here. So let's try to uh, comment out these two guys. Let's not use uh, the bean factory. So the output is as such same, right? So either use bean factory or you use application context. Now try to comment out these instructions and rerun your code, right? What you find is that application context will create the objects for you even though you don't request but the bean factory will create the objects only when you are going to request for it so spring in version of control says that you don't create objects objects will be constructed by the spring core container so there are two apis the first one is the bean factory second one is the application context application context is built on top of bean factory so bean factory constructs the objects when you request for it by calling the get bean method whereas application context will construct the objects even though you don't request for them now that's one major difference between your application context versus the bean factory so guys i hope uh, uh, you got the key difference between both the APIs. So once we are done, right? So guys, jar files need to be loaded and then you need to run your program, right? So IOC container, it has various features now. So construction of the objects, managing the entire life cycle of the object is not the headache of the developer now. So it's again spring core layer. So just like the servlet container, you got the spring container. Right, so the way servlet container manages the life cycle of a servlet in a similar way, spring container is going to manage the life cycle of your object. Then wiring them together, right, so uh, there might be dependencies which we can uh, link up and configuration means the key value pair which you have already mentioned, right. So you just need to configure your object in the XML file. So there are various features of uh, IOC container now, right, the spring IOC container by using a Java Pojo class and the configuration metadata produces a fully configured and an executable system or an application, right? So what we do, we give the metadata and the Pojo information to the Spring container, right? So if you can notice over here, so what we have given, we have given the XML file that's like metadata and we are mentioning what is the type, right? So the information is given to the spring container and the final result will be that you will be having the object which you can use in your application right so let's see once again so we got uh, two types of ioc containers one is the bean factory other one is the application context bean factory will construct the object when you request for them whereas application context will construct the object even if you will not request for them right so that's the major difference other than that bean factory is the simplest container so that we can provide basic support, for example, dependency injection. Whereas application context is built on top of Bean Factory and the container will add more enterprise specific functionalities, right? So this is uh, something which is uh, more relevant to use rather than the Bean Factory. All right, so what is a Bean now? So guys, Bean is nothing, it's a Java object more or less, right? So they are the objects which form the backbone of our application. Why we need object? We need object to contain data. And these objects within the Spring framework are managed by the Spring IOC container itself, right? Now that's the point of relaxation. Further, Spring IOC container will be the one who will be responsible to instantiate, assemble, or manage the life cycle of your entire Bean object. The configuration metadata and the Bean is given to the spring container so that we can get the constructed bean object right so that's something which is in line to your bean object so what is happening over here ioc container is gonna take the metadata right and thereafter it's gonna give us the bean let's understand the life cycle of a bean so what happens uh, the core container will construct the object and that will be responsible even to destroy the object right so we don't destroy the objects now so instantiation then populating the properties first of all constructing the object then setting the data into the object 
so setting of the data into the object is done by the setter method so if you don't have the setter method in your bean class this ioc will not be possible so you need to have setter methods right so once we are done with that part so all the setter methods are called then your applications uh, you know uh, processing will happen the apis the core container right so that's going to come into action so any post processing or any uh, properties which you need to set you can do that so you can have your custom in it and you can have your you know kind of uh, post processor available in your beans we'll see that and once the bean is ready to use right so container is finally shut down and your bean will be destroyed so guys let's try to see one basic life cycle implementation of this whole process so what i'm going to do over here in my employee i'm going to write two methods right so let's see i'm going to say public void my init so i'm going to say ciso object initialized and i'm going to write one more method so this goes like my destroy so i'm going to say object destroy now in the employee bean over here i'm just going to comment out this second guy right so let's try to use only one guy so i'm going to say init method that goes like my init and a destroy method which goes like my destroy so you can manage the life cycle of the bean right by writing your own init and destroy method so here what we have done we have mentioned that my init is the initial method where the object initialization can be done and destruction method is my destroy so you mentioned it over here coming to the client now so let's uh, i'm just going to comment out this guy as well so from my application context let's try to run the code and now what you see is that once the constructor is called thereafter your my init method is getting executed and then you can use your employee object other than that what we can do we can close this application context so that all the objects can be destroyed so to do that what i'm going to do i'm just going to get the reference to this guy class path xml application context right so i'm just going to see uh let's uh, downcast it so i'm going to downcast the context over here and thereafter i'm going to say cxt dot close so i'm just going to close the context right so close the context so i'm just going to say shut down dear spring core container so when the container is going to shut down it's going to delete all the objects available right so let's try to run the code now and now what we can see is that object is destroyed so your object destruction happens when you are explicitly closing the context so otherwise the object destruction will totally be dependent on your spring core container right so guys that's how you got the life cycle of your spring core container right so let's now try to see some more demo on a beans through a dependency injection guys right so let's see what is meant by the term dependency injection so uh, before we understand the term dependency injection we need to understand the term what is meant by coupling right so let's see that coupling uh, a theory first of all consider that i got this class employee right so we got a class employee over here now and employee is having uh, one eid then employee had one name but for the employee address i'm going to create another class right so it's a multi value thing so i'll just uh, have you know kind of uh, what's the city then what's the state what exactly is the uh, zip code right now this is where i am going to create a has a relationship and i'm going to say employee has an address right so you got this relationship available over here so it's it's basically where we have got a has a relationship uh, associated with the employee and address so employee has an address now now how you are going to create the employee object you will say employee is a new employee so within the constructor of this guy employee what i'm going to do i'm going to say eid is uh, a zero 
e name is again let's say some default value like not available and address can go like a new address so here what we have done we have done the object construction right whenever i'm doing an object construction over here so this is a high dependency dependency what is happening over here so construction of address object relies on construction of employee object now that's the scenario so what is happening over here right so guys what is happening over here when you write the object of employee then the object of address will be constructed it means that there is a dependency of your address object which is getting constructed in the constructor of the employee object it means that until and unless you don't create the employee object you can't construct the address object such a code right such a statement leads to high coupling we need to lower down the coupling first of all so we don't do it in this way so what we do we rather create one constructor which takes a reference to the address as input and thereafter what we can do we can just assign this guy like this right or what you can do you can create one setter and you mention this address over here and you say address is address so over here you construct the employee object and thereafter you can create an address object separately now you are constructing the address object separately right so there is a difference now and what i can do i can say e dot set of uh, you know uh, this uh, address as in a or i can just uh, truly create one another employee object and within the constructor of this employee object i can pass this a so in this way your employee object is constructed separately right and your address object is constructed separately so later on you can use them so you have reduced the dependency and we have achieved something known as loose coupling so for such a concept when we have a dependency so this is a dependency right that employee has a dependency on address dependency can be justified through constructor or through setter and correspondingly in the spring way right because in the spring way what we do we use an xml file right we use inversion of control so we got something known as dependency injection either through constructor or setter right so that's what the topic is so in the topic dependency injection is basically focusing on how we can reduce the coupling and thereafter we can use this key concept for our spring framework so guys it's a design pattern which will remove the dependency from the programming code that's going to make the application easy to manage and test dependency injection makes our programming code loosely coupled which means any change in the implementation of one will not affect the other right so that's what we need to achieve so in the xml file and in the java file right so we got two of the things right so you're gonna uh, use xml file to achieve dependency injection right and you will be giving it to the java so it can be done by two ways either by constructor or by the setter method for the constructor we need to use a constructor arg and for a setter method we just use the property itself right so guys let's see how we can uh, do it let's try to create first of all a different class and uh, link it all together and let's see how we can do it so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna write one more class so here we are with one more class and this class goes like address and now uh, let's have uh, three things one is the city then i'm gonna write one uh, state and finally i'm gonna mention one zip code right so these are the attributes uh, for my address right so let's say that these are the attributes and let's have uh, the methods so you can have one default constructor you can have a parameterized constructor you say source generate a constructor using the fields. 
So here we are with a parameter wise constructor. Let's say source generate of getters and setters. So these are required when you are writing a Spring IOC code, right? So without getter setter, it's not possible, right? You must do this part. Then finally, you generate one, two strings so that if you want to display the data to the user. Now coming back in my employee, so rather than having this guy address over here, right? So I'm just gonna take it like address and address. So let's try to take it in this way. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna write the methods again. So let's try to say source, generate getters and setters, right? And all right, so here we are. I don't know why it took so space, but let me just uh, rectify the code, guys. Right, so here we are with the getters and setters. And one thing which I'm going to do is I'm just going to write one employee constructor with the address as an input. Right, so let's say this of address assigned to address, right? We got the same uh, name, so uh, you're going to use it in this way. So this is like constructor injection, right? And here, if you can see, we got a setter injection. So how this injection can be given, right? That we need to figure out. So we got employee having an address, right? And address is a separate uh, a class. So come to your employee bean. So the very first thing which I'm going to do over here is I'm going to write my bean. That's like address. So co.edurica dot address, right? So you're going to create one address. So we got city, then state, and finally you got a zip code. So uh, let's say city goes like uh, Bangalore, then state goes like uh, Karnataka, and then zip code goes like five to some zeros and one, right? So let's let's uh, say that this is an address, right? So we have mapped the address as in city, state, and zip code over here. You got city, state, and zip code. Now over here in my employee, right? So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna use this guy known as constructor arc and I'm gonna say refer ADRS. So whatever this address object is available, right? ADRS. So I'm gonna give the reference ADRS over here and in my employee, the constructor injection will take place, right? And let's come to the client and now let's try to get this guy emp1 and let's try to say print of e1. So when I'm going to do e1 printing, so in my e1, so here if you can see, let's uh, create one two string. We don't have a two string over here. So let me generate one two string. So this two string is going to print the address, right? So when it's going to print the address, the address two string will be executed over here. Let's come back and let's run the code. So just give me a moment. I think some basic uh, synthetical mistake. Yeah, so here we are, right? We just need to close this. Let's uh, run the code once again. Here we are, guys, right? So object initialized. And if you can see now, you got the employee one details. Here we are the details with the employee. And here we are with the details of the address object. So this is known as a dependency injection through the constructor. So if you don't want to use a constructor injection, what we can do, we can also give it as in, so setter part goes like this. Now this dependency injection is happening on the setter part, right? When you use the property, it's gonna use the uh, set address method that's like setter injection right the output will be same anyways but the concept of utilizing the thing right it's changed now so output is same so there are two major ways to fulfill your dependency part right either you can achieve it through constructor or you can achieve it through setter let's look at the agenda for the session First and foremost, I will give you a brief overview on Spring AOP and why do we need aspect-oriented programming. Next, we will discuss some core concepts of aspect-oriented programming. Once you understand the basics of AOP, then we will dive into the practical part and learn how to create Spring AOP along with examples.
After that, we will see different advice types in AOP like after, before, around, etc. And finally, I will wrap up the session by explaining you about Aspect J example. Without any further ado, let's get straight into the module. First, we will understand what is Spring AOP, that is, Aspect Oriented Programming. Spring AOP enables aspect oriented programming in Spring applications. In AOP, aspects enable the modularization of concerns like transaction management, logging, or security that cut across multiple types and objects. And AOP provides the way to dynamically add the cross cutting concerns before, after, or around the actual logic using simple pluggable configurations. It makes easy to maintain the code in the present as well as future. You can add and remove concerns without recompiling the complete source code simply by changing the configuration files. So why do we need this AOP? As you all know, it provides the pluggable way to dynamically add the additional concern before, after or around the actual logic. Suppose say there are 10 methods as shown in the figure. And there are five methods that starts from A that is A1 to A5 and two methods from B and three that starts from C. So first let's understand the scenario. Here what I have to do is I have to maintain the log and send the notification after calling the method that starts from A. So what you might think that will be the problem without using AOP. First thing we can call the methods that maintains log and sends notification that starts with A. In such scenario, what happens? We need to write the code in all the five methods, correct? But if in future client says I don't have to send the notification, you need to change all the methods and that leads to maintenance problem. And that's exactly why we need AOP. So what is the solution that we have with AOP? Here we don't have to call the methods from the method, but we can define the additional concern like maintaining log, sending notification, etc. Later, I'll tell you how to do that. In future, if client says to remove the notifier functionality, we need to change only in the XML file. So maintenance is very easy in aspect oriented programming. So that's the whole concept why we need aspect oriented programming in Springs. Now let's move further and understand some core concepts of AOP. There are many as such like aspect, joint point, advice, point cut, target object, weaving, proxy, etc. So first we'll see what is aspect. An aspect is a class that implements the Java enterprise application concerns which cuts through multiple classes like transaction management, security, etc. And aspects can be a normal class that is configured through Spring XML configuration. So what is advice? Advices are the actual actions taken for a particular join point. Basically, they are the methods that gets executed when a certain joint point meets a matching point cut in the application. So here you can see you have the program execution and these are the joint points and the point cut and there we have the aspect code that is the advice. So what is a joint point? It's a point in the program such as method execution, exception handling, etc. Yes, and that is also a candidate point in the program execution where an aspect can be plugged in. So what is a point cut? Point cuts are the expressions that are matched with the joint points to determine whether advice needs to be executed or not. So again we have target object that is the objects on which advices are applied and in spring a subclass is created at runtime where the target method is overridden and advices are included based on their configuration. And also we have proxy that is a proxy which is an object that is created after applying advice to the target object. In terms of client the objects the target object and the proxy object are all same. So what is weaving? It is a process of linking an aspect with other application types or objects to create an advised object. So this is all about the core AOP concepts. Having understood this, let's move further and see what are the steps required to create AOP and how joint point advice aspect point cut everything are applied. So these are the four main steps. Very first thing is that we need Maven dependencies. In actual, you need to create a Maven project and add all the dependencies. Next, you must write aspect and point cut expressions. After this, 
you have to write the methods that is join points and finally you should write the main class and run the application so for maven dependencies just type mvn repository click on the first link so in this maven repository you can find all your jar files so basically say i want spring jar so you can see here you have spring web spring bean score context say i want spring context and the latest release will be 5.1.3 here you can see the dependency code being present over here you have to just copy this and this dependency code is required to import all the jars of spring context you have to paste it in the pom.xml file open your eclipse that is for enterprise edition click on new and give here as maven choose maven project click next allow it to use workspace default location only here you can see there are so many archie types like for plugin plugin start profile you have for web app site site simple but i want to choose quick start as i'm not running anything on the web click on next and now it will say group id is com.edureka and next it will ask for artifact id you can give artifact id depending on your project i'll give it like spring hyphen aop finish so here you can see you got spring aop project file click on that and click on the pom.xml file so here you can see your group id your artifact id your version your packaging that is the jar package and the name of the project is spring and the url will be your maven apache.org because it is a apache product and you can see here the dependencies of simple junit that will be present in your maven dependencies as i already told you i have not imported this jar file but it has already been imported internally from the remote location so you can see it is present in users and neha and followed by this path as you know i have copied the spring jar files correct so i will tell you one thing here for spring you need to go on importing all the jar files finding them in the website and then importing it here again it's a very complicated task right what we'll do is the code that is being present over here that is the dependencies we'll copy that and we will just paste it over here and save this it will take a little while so here you can see as i just pasted the dependency code for spring context it imported all the jar files that is context aop beans core jcl expression everything it's very simple just copying the code from maven repository and coming over here and pasting it in pom.xml simple thing again say i want the code for aop so it is showing here that you have the spring aop jar you can again copy it and paste it and say you want aspect j jar so when you type aspect j jar you can see here you have aspect j weaver runtime jrt tools everything so you need to copy and paste all these over there the latest release copy again paste it after this dependency so even that came over here now again i want aspect j runtime so even aspect jrt jar got imported over here similarly i will import all the other jars as well so basically these are the required jar files for a spring program again you can just click on help click on marketplace in the search tab just give as springs so here you can see spring tools 3 add-ons you have to install this it is very essential because it has to configure all the add-ons with eclipse so you have to install this i have already installed so it is saying as installed so basically you can see here i have a spring dashboard over here so after installing this this should appear i hope that you understood about dependencies and everything from maven repository now let's see how to create a basic customer service class and print few methods for demonstration i have already created that so i'll just open that project so this should be your directory structure as you can see inside the source there is main and inside main i have java and com.edureka is a group id and edureka is the artifact id and i have three classes over here 
So first I will open customer service. So here you can see I have used only two variables that is name and URL correct and I have used some setters and getters that is set name and set URL and then trying to print the URL and the name using print name and print URL methods very simple class. So you don't have to worry about this directory structure because by default it will take this way. But the only thing that you have to worry about is your group ID your artifact ID etc. And now in the resources I have customer.xml file. So these things you will get it from any of the website or anywhere you can just copy and paste this for springs or else you can even note it down from here also no issues for that. You can just pause it and you can just copy this thing from here. And now what we have to do here is after writing this XML location and everything we have to configure bean. In this we will write a bean class with ID name value etc. So bean ID will be your customer service and class format goes like this that is your group ID artifact ID followed by the class name and the property name will be a name of your own choice. I have given it as edureka and the value and property URL will be our edureka website. You can give anything of your own choice. Apart from this I have done one more thing here. That is I have applied before advice method. It has to execute before the join point methods and they are configured using before annotation mark. I'll show you where I have configured it using before annotation mark. So this will be your main class where you have declared your main method. In this main method I have set application context and I've given the XML application context class path that will be your customer.xml because your XML file name is customer.xml. So you have to specify this and then for get bean method I'm giving it like app context dot get bean which will be your customer service proxy. So this customer service proxy is being set over here. That is your bean ID for before. If you don't want to do before advice, you can just simply delete this part and your output will be just edureka and followed by your website name. But as I have already included before advice, so I'm specifying the bean ID will be customer service proxy that which I have given in this file. That is your get bean. And this class will be from your factory bean. And the property will be target and the reference will go to again customer service and your property name will be inceptors name. And I have given value like something before bean method. So what happens this before bean method will be executed before the username and your website. Here you can see I have used a class name that implements method before advice. And I have used before method to print the message that is hijacked. Simple. Save this. Don't get confused. This is only for before advice. If you don't want before advice, you can just run it without this and just removing this part of code. But then, as I have already used this before advice, I'm showing you how it works. So, after that, in your main class, you can just simply print the customer name and customer URL. So let's run the program and check the output. So you can see here as I told without advice it just prints edureka and followed by your website. So this is how basically your spring example works. Now we'll see different types of advices. That will be your before advice after advice after returning from the advice and around the advice. So as you already know before advice means it executes before the join point that is your method. And next after advice it is advised to execute after the join point methods and next will be your after returning from the advice that is it executes after the join point completes and around the advice means it executes before and after the join points and are configured using at around annotation mark. Now we'll see how before advice and after advice works. All that you have to do is you have to make a small modification over here. So just change this customer service proxy and in this all that you have to just do is include this bean configuration. That's all. So here you can see I have created a class called hijack after method. 
so that it will display this message that is your hijacking after method bean. So this message will be displayed after your join point. Okay, because I have applied the advice after the join point. So by default, it will display it after the join point only. And I have made some modifications and given here as customer service proxy and in the customer.xml file. I have declared the bean ID as hijack after method bean and given the class name that is your hijack after method class name and then the bean ID will be customer service proxy and the class name will be by default from the spring framework and then property name will be your target and the reference will be customer service. So save this and when you run the program you can see the output over here first will be your customer name that is edureka and then it is telling hijacked after method that is after method it's been hijacked and again it's telling the customer website and again you're getting the advice after method so this is how it works if you want it before i'll show you even how to do that as well nothing much change in this the only change that happens will be in hijack after bean method and in customer.xml let's see how it occurs i'll modify the same program so what i have done here is Instead of giving hijack after method, I have given it before method and I have changed implementation to before advice and in displaying that I said it prints before method. Okay, save this and now go to customer.xml wherein you have to change certain things. I'll tell you what are they. Everything remains same. You just have to give before over here and even over here as well. Save this again run the program. So what you guess will be the output. So as I told it appears before the method. So you can see here it's appearing before the customer name and the customer URL. So this is how before works and if you want for around as well I'll show you how I will again modify this file. So this is my code in which I have given hijack around method and it implements method interceptor and then I'm passing the name and arguments. And I'm just telling like it has to print around the method again in try and catch block I'm trying to catch an exception if it does not occur now again go back to your customer.xml file and change few things that will be your around over here as well and even here as well and again the same thing even in case of value you have to make it around save this as you can see I'm not recompiling the entire thing I'm just saving the files and I'm just executing that as I'm running the main class only. This makes you understand it is very easy for maintaining purpose. So when you run this, let's check what will be the output for around the method. So here you can see first what it is printing method arguments. Then it is telling it is hijack around the bean method. And again, it's displaying it's hijack. So what is happening here is it is getting hijacked around the name and URL and then it's telling to print the URL method arguments and then if there is anything that has to be thrown as an exception it is throwing here as well. So basically this is how you can apply the advices before after and around the joint points like that is around the methods. I hope you're clear with this. Now let's move further and understand the aspect J annotations. One of the key components of spring is the aspect oriented programming framework, correct? While spring IOC container does not depend on AOP, meaning that you don't need to use AOP if you don't want to. And AOP complements spring IOC to provide a very capable middleware solution. Just like the key unit of modularity in AOP is the class, in AOP the unit of modularity is the aspect. Aspects enable the modularization of concerns such as transaction management that cut across multiple types and objects. And Aspect J has grown into a complete and popular AOP framework. And Spring supports that are written with Aspect J annotations. And since Aspect J annotations are supported by more and more AOP frameworks, your Aspect J styles are more likely to be reused in AOP frameworks that support Aspect J. And now we'll see how we are implementing aspect J over here. And for that, we are using aspect J annotations. So, first, again, project dependencies, spring beans, enable the aspect J, and then apply advises. Let's see how to do that. 
So I have created three classes over here. One is track, one is operation, and the final main class that is app.java. So in case of track class, I have applied the annotations that is at aspect, at point cut, that will be your point cut name, and then I have applied before advice as well. So this is how basically we apply the annotations. And you can see here I have imported aspect j dot lang dot join point as the annotation. So this will be my track dot java which is useful for tracking and then in the operation class I have message is invoked method m is invoked and method k is as well invoked. So that will be your method k your method m and the message. So finally I'm giving it like return return one return two return three. And now coming to app.java, you can see I'm calling the message, I'm calling method m, and I'm calling method k. So in the application context, I'm just specifying the XML file that will be present in your resources. So again, it's similar. And here your bean ID will be op bean, and your class will be this operation class. And then again, your one more bean ID will be track my bean, and your class name will be this track that will be followed by your group ID and artifact ID as well. Simple. So when it is calling this, I'll just give you a hint as how the output occurs. So first it says calling this message from this class, and it goes back to your operation class and it says message method is invoked. And then again it says I'm calling M, and it again says method m is invoked and again it follows with k as well so i'll save this and i will run the program let's wait for the output now as i told you it will tell calling message and it said message m is invoked and then i'm calling method m and again it got invoked and again i'm calling k and even k method as well got invoked so basically this app.java will redirect to operation.java class wherein it will call all these methods and then I have used execution of operation M that will be your point cut so it will print accordingly. I hope you understood how point cuts join points and aspects everything can be applied and how advisors can also be applied before the join point after the join point around the join points etc. In a world where we're working with programming languages on a day-to-day -day basis, all of us tend to search for methods and tricks to make our life easy, right? Well, dependency injection is one such technique which aims to help the developers code easily by providing dependencies of another object. And I welcome you to this session on what is dependency injection. So in this session, you'll mainly focus on, you'll mainly understand what is dependency injection and how you can use it. So without wasting any further time, let's take a look at the topics for today's session. So we'll start today's session by understanding what is dependency injection and then I'll talk about inversion of control. After that, I'll tell you the different types of dependency injection and then tell you the benefits of dependency injection or maybe why you should use dependency injection. Finally, I'll end this session by showing you how you can implement dependency injection using Spring Boot. Now before I start with the session, let me tell you that if you're if you're interested in learning about the top trending technologies in today's market and then you want to scale up your career according to that, you can go ahead and subscribe to our Eduraker YouTube channel to get daily notified on the top trending technologies. Right? So now since I've told you what topics I'm gonna to cover in today's session, let's get started with today's session. So what is dependency injection? Now, if I have to tell you what dependency injection is, you can just understand that, you know, dependency injection is the ability of an object to supply dependencies of another object. Now, I'm pretty sure that, you know, you might not have understood anything with the technical terms over here, right? Like I've just told you that, you know, it just applies dependencies to the other object. So let me just clear the confusion for you. Before I tell you what dependency injection in programming means, let me tell you what dependency is. What do you understand by the term dependency in English? It's something relying on something else, right? Well, that's the same in the case of programming also. Dependency in programming is an approach where a class uses specific functionalities of another class. So for example, if you can see on my screen, I've considered two classes over here, that is class A and class B. And let's say that, you know, class A uses the functionalities of class B. And so when class A uses the functionalities of class B, you can just understand the fact that, you know, class A has a dependency of class B, right? Now, if you're using both these classes in Java, then you might be knowing to a fact that, you know, you have to create an instance of class B before the objects are being used by class A, right? 
only if you create the instances of class B before the class A uses it only then it is said that you know class A is dependent on class B. So I hope you have understood what dependency in programming is right? It's just that you know when you have two classes and then a specific class wants to use the functionalities of the other class then that is said to be dependency and then in case of Java if you want to use these classes then you first have to create the instance of the class B and only then class A can use it. Now if I have to define dependency injection for you then you can understand dependency injection as process of creating an object for some other class and let the class directly use that particular dependency right now for example let's say you know a class asks the dependency injection for two objects right so what dependency injection will do is that you know according to the request of the class dependency injection will create two objects and then what will happen is dependency injection will just return those objects to that particular class Right, so I hope the flow is clear to you. Initially, the class will ask the dependency injection for two objects, and then the dependency injection will create two objects. Once it creates, it just returns those objects back to the class. Now, if you observe over here, there were mainly three classes involved that is, the client class, injector class, and the service class. Right, well, the client class is basically the class which is the dependent class and is dependent on the service class. The service class is the class which provides a service to the client class. And finally, the injector class is responsible for injecting the service class object into the client class, right? So if you see the flow on my screen, then you can see that you know the client class uses the service class and the injector class injects the dependency to the client class, right? So that's how basically dependency injection works, guys. It's really simple to understand. You just have to understand that you know when you have various number of classes and then you want to use the functionalities of maybe some other class and maybe you don't want to create objects manually, that's where dependency injection comes into picture. Right, so I hope you've understood what is dependency injection. Now, next in the session, let me take you to the principle based on which dependency injection came into picture. Well, that is inversion of control. So, next in this tutorial on dependency injection, let's talk about the principle behind which dependency injection came into picture. So, what is inversion of control? So, as I just mentioned, inversion of control is a principle based on which the dependency injection is made. Also, as the name suggests, you can understand to the fact that, you know, inversion of control is basically used to invert different kinds of additional responsibilities of a class rather than the main responsibility. So, if I have to explain you in simpler terms, then you can just consider an example of maybe, you know, you know, cooking, right? So, what you can do is either you can cook, cook for yourself, right? So, you can cook food for yourself, or what you can do is you can just open Swiggy, Zomato, Food Panda, or any other website to order food, right? So basically what's happening over here is when you have the ability of the cook according to the IOC principle so that is basically according to the inversion of control principle you can invert the control so instead of you cooking the food for yourself what you can do is you can just directly order the food from outside where you know you get the food at your doorstep right so basically this process of getting food delivered from outside at your doorstep and you doing nothing in that picture is basically inversion of control so whenever you have a class, so basically if you consider yourself as a class and then your responsibility is to cook food, right? Now what you're doing is you don't want to take care of this additional responsibility and then you're asking somebody else to do it for you, right? So you just order. So basically you'd ask some other class to basically perform that functionality for you. That is basically order food for yourself and then you just directly get the food at your doorstep, right? Now in the scenario where you don't have to cook for yourself and instead you can just order the food directly and let the delivery executive deliver the food for you. You're basically trying to avoid all the additional responsibilities of your class and then just trying to focus on the main responsibilities, right? So this is basically what is the inversion control guys. Inversion control says that you know a class should not configure its dependencies statically but should be configured by some of the class from outside. Also, it mentions to the fact that you know a class should concentrate on fulfilling its main responsibilities maybe like you know a flow of an application or maybe not creating objects or how your application works and so on and it should try to avoid the additional responsibilities as far as possible. So basically when you avoid additional responsibilities you have to make sure that you know somebody or the other may fulfills those responsibilities right. So that is where dependency injection comes guys dependency injection takes care of those additional responsibilities and then helps the class to fulfill all kinds of responsibilities. So guys that was the concept behind dependency injection. So now that I've told you the principle behind dependency injection. Let me take you through the types of dependency injection. So there are mainly three types of dependency injection. Now when I say types of dependency injection I mean that you know how you can implement dependency injection in your project files right. So there are mainly three ways to do that. 
either you set up a constructor injection or you set up a setter injection or an interface injection coming to the constructor injection basically in this type of injection the injector supplies the dependencies through the client class constructor coming to the setter injection in this type of injection the injector method injects the dependency to the setter method exposed by the client so the setter injection is also known as the property injection so it's basically where you play around with the getter setter methods coming to the interface injection in this type of injection the injector uses the interface to provide the dependency to the client class so basically the client must implement an interface that will expose a setter method which will then accept the dependency so basically guys these are the three types of dependency injection that is the constructor injection the setter injection and the interface injection right so till now I hope that you know you've understood that dependency injection is responsible to create objects to understand which classes require those objects and finally provide those classes with the objects. So now on that note, let's take a look at the benefits of dependency injection. So the benefits of dependency injection mainly also imply to why you should actually use dependency injection. So let's understand the same. So now before I list down the benefits of dependency injection, let me tell you what is the need of dependency injection, right? So for example, let's take an industry level project where you know they have a class of email service, right? Now this particular class responsibility is to basically take care of the emails received. Now what do you think will be the objects for this particular class? It's quite obvious it will be the two email address, the from, the subject and the body and maybe many more, but let's take these four into consideration now. Now let's say you know if the company wants to expand themselves and maybe they also want to save the text and the audio messages, right? Now do you think this class with this this set of objects can save the text and the audio messages? Not only that, do you think this class can you know take care of the complete responsibility of saving each and every factor of the uh, text and the audio messages? Well, the answer is no, right? Now this is because obviously the email class cannot handle the parameters of the text and the audio messages. Now in such cases what you have to do is you have to basically recreate the class for this particular scenario. So for example, let's say that you know you want to save the text and the audio messages then you automatically have to recreate this email service class based on the parameters of those particular messages. Now this might be sounding quite simple to you guys, but if you take the same example on an industry level, it's quite cumbersome like you know every time there's an update or maybe every time the company wants to do something new. They cannot simply just sit and recreate the classes, right? Now to avoid such scenarios what they what they can simply do is they can use the dependency injection. So with dependency injection what they can make sure is that you know they can change the objects at the runtime. So in this way you don't have to basically recreate the class and obviously then you just have to you obviously based on whatever type of messages that you want to save you can just change the objects at the runtime. So that's where basically dependency injection plays a role in industry level wherever you see a scenario of recreating the class and maybe you don't want to recreate the class then you can just use the dependency injection and just change the objects at the runtime so that you know you can use the objects based on whatever query that you have. So I hope that you know you've understood why you should use dependency injection. So now if I have to just list down the benefits of dependency injection then let me tell you that you know it enables loose couplings. So basically it enables a really easy way to interconnect the components right. So as you might have heard in my previous explanation. I told that you know there were three classes right the client the service and the injector class. So with dependency injection you can interconnect the components really easily coming to the second benefit that is application can be extended easily. I think this point you might have understood by now when I gave you the example of email service class right. So basically you can extend the applications by you know where you don't have to recreate the classes you can just use those classes only and maybe you can just have to change the objects. Then coming to the third benefit that is unit testing. So unit testing is made much easier because whatever product that you have maybe if you want to just test then it becomes really easy. And finally the reduction of boilerplate code as you know the dependency injection understands to the fact that you know it has to create an object and then it knows which classes require those objects and it returns those objects right. So you don't have to mention a lot of code for your project based for this particular factor right. So guys these were the benefits of dependency injection. So I hope that you've understood what is dependency injection. What was the principle behind it? What, what are the types behind dependency injection and finally the benefits of dependency injection, right? So now in this session, let's look into how we can implement dependency injection using Spring Boot, right? So let's get started with today's hands on. So to start today's hands on you first have to open your Eclipse ID. So if you want to know how you want to open Eclipse ID or maybe how you want to download Eclipse ID. You can refer to my video on installing Eclipse. Apart from that, I'm going to use Spring Boot, right? So for that, I've installed a software known as Spring Tool Suit. 
So to do that what I did is I went to help I went to Eclipse marketplace. So after that what I did is I searched for spring tool suit and let me just search. And then you can see that you know, I've already installed Spring Tool Suit, right? So when you want to use Spring Boot plugins into your Eclipse ID, you can just download this particular ID. So you just have to click on this install button, and then automatically you'll see that you know the Spring Tool Suit is getting installed, right? So since I've already installed into my system, I'm not going to install it over here again. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by creating a Spring Startup project. So for that, what I'll do is I'll right-click over here, go to New, and let's say I choose Project over here. I'll choose Spring Startup Project. Click on Next. And let's say you know we mention the name of the project. So let's say we mention example right after that I let all the other stuff be same like you know the Java version group artifact and all because that's not what we are focusing on in the session after that I'll click on next and then I'll click on finish right once I click on finish you'll see automatically that you know a project has been created. Now if I just open this project you'll see various files such as domain Java main resources test Java and so on. So the main dependencies file basically has all the dependencies stored for your project. The Java file will basically have a package that we just created that was example and then inside that we have an example application or Java file right. So this is basically a main file which will execute the complete project. So let's wait for it to open. All right. So now let me just zoom in. All right, so as you can see on my screen, this is basically my application file which I'm going to execute right now initially what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another class in the same package and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect these classes. So for that what I'll do is I'll go back to the package over here right click over here go to new and choose class over here. I'll mention the class name. So let's say I mention customers and then I'll click on finish. So this is basically how you create a class guys. So what I've done is in the same package where the application file is present. I've created another class known as customer right now. What I'll do is I'll basically add few objects for this particular class. Let's say you know we add the customer ID customer name and course name. So for that what I'll mention is I'll mention private int let's say cast ID. Let's say we mention private spring let's say cast name and then private string course name right so these are basically the three objects that i've created inside the customer class right now what i'll do is i'll generate the getter setter methods for all these objects so i'll just select all of them right click over here go to source and then I'll choose the option of generate getter and setter methods right after that I'll select all and then click on generate. So once I click on generate you can clearly see that you know automatically the getter and the setter methods are created for all these particular objects. So I'll just put these objects at the starting of the code so that it's easy to understand until now I've what I've done is I've created a project and then I've created another class known as customers into the same package right. Now consider a scenario where you have to create an object for the customers and you don't want to do it manually right. So initially what I did was I created the objects manually. Now let's say you know you do want to do it manually. Now in such scenario basically as I told you before you have to use the dependency injection to get the objects wherever and whenever you want right. So next let's look into how you can use dependency injection over here. So initially what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my application file over here and then what I'll do is I'll basically change this line. So what's happening in this line what's basically happening is that you know a spring container gets created on this particular line and then it basically returns an object right. So over here what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this line to configurable. So let me just type in configurable application context. And then I'll mention context is equal to let this be the same that a spring application run example application dot class arguments right and now if you see an error that's because we have to import right so I'm just going to import this particular framework and then you'll automatically see that the error has gone so basically what's happening over here is that you know we get a spring container right. So basically in this line of run a spring container gets created and now whatever is going to be present in this particular container is known as spring bean. So basically what you have to do is whatever objects that you want to return will be known as spring bean and they will be present in this particular container. 
So over here what I'm doing is I'm basically returning the context and then I'm initializing the container and in this container I'm going to mention all the objects right now which objects have to be returned or maybe which objects that you want to be present in spring container is what you have to mention. So to do that what you'll do is let's type in enter and then on the next line I'll mention customers. See that is basically an object that I'm taking and then I'm mentioning context dot get bean right and then what I'll mention is I'll mention the class name right so that is customers dot class right after that I'll just end with a semicolon right so basically what I'm mentioning over here is I've initialized a spring container now I'm telling what has to be present in the spring container that is basically I want an object of the customer class that we just created so that is what this particular line means guys now to check whether you know this is working or not what you can simply do is you can go back to the customers class and then let's say you know we add a new method let's say public void let's say we mention the method display and then let's say we put in we just print something so let's say we just print object created successfully right right and then I'll just end with a semicolon now what I'll do is basically I'll use this particular method into the application class so what I'll do is I'll go back to my application class and then I'll mention C dot display right so basically I'm using the method so what happens is you're calling the object of the customers class with a reference of the display method right so this is basically the object of the customer class and then I'm calling this particular object with the reference of this particular method display that I just created over here. Now let's see when we execute what what do we get. So I'll just right click over here go to run as and choose spring boot app and then I'll just click on OK. All right now once this executes you see an error like maybe you see an exception that you know no such bean definition exception right so basically no qualifying bean of the type com dot example dot demo dot customers is available right now this is because you know you have created a class that is customers and then you have an application class but you have not defined the class to be a spring bean right so what I mean by that is you have initialized the spring container but you've not defined the object of the customer class to be a spring bean right so to initialize that particular object to be a spring bean what you have to do is you have to go back to your customers class and then you just have to use the annotation component. So this is basically a spring boot annotation and then you just have to import right. So once you import you'll see that you know there's no error. So with the help of this annotation component what you're doing is you're telling the spring container that we need an object of the customer class and then when you use this annotation component the spring container automatically understands. After that when you go back to the application class and then when you mention customer C is equal to context or get being customer class the compiler will automatically understand that you know it has to check whether there is a customer being available or not. If there is a customer being available it's going to return that particular objects method right. So basically you'll see an output that, that we mentioned over here that is basically object created successfully. So if the bean is available then the spring framework is injecting the customer object into your application right. So basically this object is created by the spring framework which can be further used into your application. So now let's just execute and see. So if I just right click over here again go to run as and choose spring boot app. Just click on OK. You'll see an output that you know object created successfully right. So with this what I mean that you know automatically the spring framework has created an object. So basically the compiler has checked whether there is a customer being available or not. If the bean is available the spring framework is injecting this particular customer object into your application right. So when something is injecting into your application and then you don't have to create it what's happening that's what is dependency injection right. So guys basically this is how you can implement dependency injection using spring boot. Now if I have to just extend this demo and then show you how you can implement dependency injection using auto wide annotation what you can do is you can create another class so let's say I create another class so I go to new over here and choose class and let's say we mention it to be technologies right and then I click on finish once I click on finish you'll see that you know automatically the class is created so let's say we create objects of technology class let's say I create tech id and tech name right so I'll mention private int tech id and then I'll mention 
private string tech name. Now let's say you know we again just mentioned the getter and the setter methods for these particular parameters. So I'll right click over here, go to source, and then choose generate getter and setter methods. Select all and click on generate. Right. So automatically you'll see that you know the getter and the setter methods I've got generated, right? So I'll just put these particular parameters at the top, right? So now next, similarly to the customer class, let's say I create a method. So I'll just mention public void and let's say tech right and in this particular method let's say i mention system dot out dot print ln and then i mention successful right and then i just end it with a semicolon right so basically this is how your code looks what I've done is I've created a new class technologies and then it has two objects so you can say parameters that is private uh, int that is basically tech ID and tech name and then finally I created a method with the method name tech name which prints successful. Now let's take a scenario where you want to call the tech method into the customer class right so basically what I'm saying is I want to call this particular method to the customer class and then to do that what you have to do is you basically have to create an object of the technologies class. So what you'll do is you'll go back to customers class over here and then you'll mention private technologies that is basically my class name and let's say I mentioned tech detail right so this is basically my object that I've created for the technology class which I've mentioned in my customer class right now once I'm done with this let's say I just again get the getter and the setter methods so I'll just go to source over here generate and choose generate getter and setter methods and click on generate automatically you'll see that you know the methods have got generated next what I want to do is I want to use the tech method right so basically that was the method that I created in the technologies class and then I want to use that particular method so to do that what I'll do is I'll go to the customers class and under the display method of this particular class I mention tech detail and then I mention tech Right, so this is basically the method that I created and this is the tech detail is basically the object that I created in the customer class for the technologies class, right? So that's what you can see over here. Where is it? I'm sorry. I skipped it. Yeah, this is basically the object, right? So I'll just put it over here so that there's no confusion, right? Now to make sure that you know the tech detail object is instantiated you have to mention the add rate component in the technologies class so that stands the same again as I previously mentioned basically you have a spring container and then you want to make sure that you know a spring bean is instantiated so that you know whatever object you want to return is returned right so for that I'll mention component that is basically the component annotation and then I'll import the required packages. Now let's say you know we execute this project so till now it looks fine to your eyes right we have created three classes that is basically our application is a main file and then we have created two other classes that is the customer class and the technologies class. Now what we have done is in the technologies class we have, we have a method that is known as tech and then I want to use that particular tech method into the customers class. So to do that what I've done is I've created an object of the technologies class that is the tech detail and then I've generated getter and setter methods for that. After that what I did is I just use this particular object that I just created with the me method name right so it looks fine to your eyes right so let's see what happens now if I just execute this so for that I'll go to run as all right I'll go over here I'll go to run as and choose spring boot app and then I'll click on OK. Now when you execute the project you see an error that is basically null pointer exception right so that's basically coming because you know now the customer class is dependent on the technologies class. And yet to the fact the customer class doesn't know the existence of technologies class, right? So what I'm saying is that you know class A is dependent on class B, but the class A doesn't know the existence of class B. So you'll have to make sure that you know the class A gets to know the existence of class B, right? So basically to enable the customer class to recognize the technologies class, you have to insert the add the rate auto wired annotation into the customer's class. I'll just mention add the rate auto wired over here and then I'll just import the required packages. So once I include this annotation at the add the rate auto wired what's happening is basically that you know you have a spring container 
and then you have an object of the class that is basically the customer class. Now the customer class is dependent on the technologies class and the customer class doesn't know the existence of technologies class, right? So basically when you insert this particular annotation that is add rate auto wired automatically the customer class comes to know the existence of the technologies class. So the dependency of one class to other class is initialized and automatically when you just execute this particular project. So you'll see an output of object created successfully and also the second method which prints out successful, right? So let's just execute this particular project. So when I execute this particular project, you'll see an output that you know object created successfully and successful, right? So that's basically how the dependency between classes is fulfilled. Over here, the add rate auto wide annotation played a role to make class A realize the existence of class B. And the add rate component annotation is basically used to make sure that you know the spring container gets its spring bean and automatically the objects are created without you doing it manually. In this session, I will talk about how Spring Framework integrates with Model View and Controller. And I also suggest you to subscribe to Edureka channel to kickstart your learning and also hit the bell icon to get the notifications for the latest update on the channel. So, without wasting any further time, let's get straight into the module. First, I will tell you what is Spring MVC. And after that, I will talk about the Spring Model View Controller Framework and the workflow of the framework. Followed by that, I will talk about how to create a Spring MVC project and how to include all the dependencies and how exactly it works with the help of an example. And finally, I will wrap up the session by telling you some of the advantages of Spring MVC Framework. Now, without wasting any further time, let's get straight into the module. First, let's see what is Spring MVC. So Spring MVC is a Java framework which is used to build web applications. It follows the model view controller design pattern. Not just that, it also implements all the basic features of a core Spring framework like inversion of control, dependency injection, etc. So now let's see what Spring MVC provides us. It also provides a dignified solution to use MVC in the Spring Framework with the help of a dispatcher servlet. So what is dispatcher servlet? So dispatcher servlet is a class that receives the incoming request and maps it to the right resource such as controller, model and view. So as you all might be aware that every web application integrates with Spring Framework because it does not require web server activation. And with Spring MVC, this web server activation support is built in. And you are not bound to any container lifecycle that you need to manipulate. And that's why every one of them uses Spring MVC web application on a Spring tool suit. Now, with this, let's move further and see the model view and controller framework of Spring. So, this is a model view and controller Spring framework, and it comprises of a web browser a front controller, a model and a view. So now let me explain you all these components in detail. So a model contains the core data of the application. Data can either be a single object or a group of objects. And you have a controller. It contains the business logic of an application. You can use at controller annotation to mark this class as a controller. So if you have a computer system, and if you want to name which part of your computer is a controller, then I can say CPU as a controller. So basically, all the work that is done by CPU in a computer is done by a controller in the Spring MVC framework. So I hope you understood what exactly it is. And you have a view. This is used to represent the information in a particular format, like in your Excel format, and you can also use JSP, that is your Java server pages, to create a view page. If I have to again compare a computer system and your Spring MVC, so I can say easily that the monitor or the display that you get is a view, right? And you have a front controller, and thus the dispatcher servlet class works as a front controller. So now let's see how internally Spring integrates with the model view and controller approach. So you can see first when a request is sent to the dispatcher servlet, the request is also sent from dispatcher servlet to handler mapping, to controller, to view resolver, and to view. 
So when a request is sent to a dispatcher servlet, the request is sent to handler mapping and a controller. So when it comes to controller, the controller functions internally and sends the response that will be a model and a view back to dispatcher servlet. And then this dispatcher servlet sends the view to a view resolver. And when it gets resolved in the view resolver functionality, then it will be presented as a view. So after all these functionalities, then you will get the output, right? So basically, the incoming requests are obstructed by the dispatcher servlet that works as a front controller. And the dispatcher servlet gets an entry of handler mapping from the XML file and forwards the request to the controller. And after that, the controller returns an object of model and view. And finally, the dispatcher servlet checks the entry of the view resolver in the XML file and then invokes the specified view component. So that's exactly how it works. Okay. Now let's move further and see a small example of Spring MVC. So there are various steps that you have to understand. First, you need to create a new Maven project and add all the dependencies. Then you have to create a controller class and configure the web XML file. And after that, you have to define the bean in the XML file. And then you need to create a JSP page and execute the program, right? So now let's see how it works. So as I've already told you first you need to create a Maven project in Eclipse. So just go to file click on new choose Maven project. Just click on next and in this case you have to use Maven archetype web app because you're creating a web application and not a simple project. So that is the reason you have to use Maven archetype web app. Then you have to click on next. Then you have to provide your artifact ID, your group ID, and everything. When you present your artifact ID as, you know, Spring, this turns out to be your package name. So you have to click on Finish. If you wish to know how to create a Maven project, and you know, if you want to know how to configure your Spring framework, you can check out the video on our YouTube playlist on Spring Framework, and you'll understand all the fundamentals. As I have already created a project called Spring MVC. You can see here it's a Maven project. It comprises of a deployment descriptor, which is an Arche type created web application. You have the Java resources as well, and you have Java libraries. And I also suggest you to configure your Apache Tomcat server because I have to run a project on a server, and that's the reason it is very essential. Again, if you wish to know about this, you can check out the video on servlet and JSP tutorial. And you will understand even this as well. And I have the Maven dependencies, which is very important. And this is the source file inside. I have my main. Inside that, I have two folders that is a resource and a web app. So inside the resource, I have com, edureka, and a controller that is edition.java. And again, I have a web app in that I have webinf. The one is the bean configuration file and the other one is my web.xml file for navigating through the web page and then I have a target. Again, this comprise of web resource and I have my Maven manifest. So you can see here. This is the structure that it should maintain and first thing is I have to configure my pom.xml file. So you can see here. This is the pom.xml file. That is a page object model XML file and it comprises of all the dependencies. So the dependencies that is required is the Spring Framework Web MVC. You need the MySQL connector jar, you need Java X servlet, and you need Spring Context, and that's all. So you simply have to navigate through, you know, MVN repository and you have to just copy the Maven code that is. The dependency code, for example, say I want Spring MVC. I'll search for this. So this is what I require. I'll click on this and I'll get the latest release. So you can see there are various options. So you have a jar, so you have a Maven dependency code, you have Gradle, you have SBT, Grape, Build R, many things. But as I'm using Maven, I just have to, you know. Select this, copy, and paste it in my perm.xml file. Very simple. That's what I did. So these are the various jar files that I need. So have a look at these jar files.
and also when I click on this project, I'll choose build path and configure build path. So you can see I have the Maven dependency. I have Apache Tomcat library and also I have the GRE system. Apply and close. So make sure your jar files, your dependencies, everything is configured before you jump into executing a project. Okay. So after this, the next step what you have to do is you have to create a controller class. In order to create a controller class, I'm using two annotations that is add controller and add annotation. Right? So add controller marks this class as a controller. And at request mapping is used to map the class with a specified URL. So this URL that I'm using will refer to the view page that is index.jsp. This is my JSP view page. What I'm doing, I'm just giving welcome to Eureka. So this message should be executed on the browser using the server that is the Tomcat server, right? So now let's see how I have configured this controller. So I'm importing the controller and the request mapping package inside that I've just created a method called public string display and written the index index refers to this so it will return this message on the web browser. So it does not end here. I also have to configure the bean class and the web.xml file. So these are the configuration of all the bean class and defining the bean in an XML file is necessary to specify the view components. In this, the context component scan element defines the base package where dispatcher servlet will search the controller class. So, this defines the base package and the dispatcher servlet will handle the controller class. And I have a web.xml file as well. In this, what I'm doing, I'm specifying the servlet class, which is the dispatcher servlet that acts as a front controller in the Spring MVC and all the incoming requests for the HTML file will be forwarded to the dispatcher servlet. So you can see I'm giving the display name that is a web app and the servlet name will be spring inside the servlet and the servlet class will be this because it's a dispatcher servlet that I have already told you and inside the servlet mapping I have to specify the servlet mappings as well. So the URL pattern is this which is the same in my controller, right? The request mapping is used to match with the URL pattern. So that's what I'm doing here and I'm also giving the servlet name. So now when I run this project as run as run on server. Let's see what happens. It's asking for the server. I'll choose server nine and I'll click on the next. This is my project and finish. You can see that your server has started. So you can see that it is loading all the definitions from servlet context and it's initializing as well. It will take a while. That's fine. There's no problem in that. So you can see here the servlet was up and running and it also navigated through the browser and it displayed the output that is welcome to Edureka message on the browser, right? So that's exactly how it works and this is how you need to configure your controller class, your bean configuration file and your view page that is a JSP page. So next let's see one more example where I will tell you how to enter the username and then it will display the data as well in a particular format. I have already configured a project for that as well and as I have already told you you need all the dependencies. So I have the Java resources you have your Maven dependencies. I have already configured the pom.xml file and everything. So first let's see the controller class. So as I have already told you at controller annotation is used to mark the class as a controller and the request mapping will refer to the URL pattern from the web.xml file. And I'm using the method called request method dot get to get the values from the view page. Okay, and it's very simple. First, it will refer to the method and it will say the home page requested and it will print the locale and then it will get the date format. And this is the method how you need to configure the date format. And finally, it will display the time on the server. Whatever the time is, it will display the time on the server. And I have one more file here called username. 
So this is used to return the username that you are going to enter on the browser. So this is all about the controller. First, let's see how your web content file looks like. So I have my view pages that is user.jsp and home.jsp. So inside the home.jsp page, in my h1 tag i have written hello please enter the username to log in and after you enter the username it will go to user.jsp and it will print hi and followed by your username so first you have to use a dollar and followed by the username which implies your username will be displayed it will print the time on the server so again this is the format and here i'm using the form action because i want to input the text that is a username and submit the value so for that reason I'm using a form action once it logins it will say hello followed by the username so these requests will go to your controller class so the controller first will return the username and then it will display the date based on this format and inside the URL pattern that is followed by this method it will say username page has requested and once it gets the response it will return back the user simple so this is how you need to configure your view and controller. So now your model will be the bean class. So you have to define your bean that is a dispatcher servlet and you have to define the base package that is com.edureka.spring which I have defined it before and also there is a bean property. You have to define views and your controllers in this class. Once this is configured you need to go back to your web.xml file and configure for launching the web page and navigating to the particular request website and then performing the actions on the web page so again this is a parameter name and this is a servlet mapping that i have defined and this is a url pattern so once when i execute the program let's see how it works again i'll choose the same server that is tomcat 9.0 and i'll run the example so as I told you it first says hello, please enter the username to log in and it will display the time on the server. So I'll enter the username as Edureka and hit the login button and it's telling hi followed by Edureka simple again. If I want to change the username and give something like this hit the enter button. It will again navigate to this and you can see here on the server info first it is telling the home page was requested and then two times I have requested the user page because two different times I gave two different username. That's the reason. Now let's move further and see some of the advantages of Spring MVC. First it is lightweight as Spring is a lightweight framework. There will not be any performance issues in Spring based web application. Next high productive Spring MVC can boost your development process and that's the reason it is highly productive. Now talking about the security most of the online banking web applications are developed using Spring MVC because of its high security and as you all know it is MVC supported and that's the reason it is a great way to develop modular web application and also it comprises of a separate class for specified roles like model command validator etc and that's why it plays a role of separation. So these are some of the advantages of Spring framework. Let's start and let's see what we have uh, got for you. So what exactly uh, is basically uh, the Spring framework in the market? So let's have a look on to first, right? So guys, Spring Source was the company created by the founders of the Spring framework, right? And it merged into uh, Covalent in January 29, 2008. So Spring Source was uh, purchased by VMware for approximately $420 million in 2009, right? So this is something where we are uh, trying to come up with some history. So Spring's dominance over the years has increased, right? And it basically is having one monopoly in the field of web frameworks, specifically in Java Enterprise Edition. So Spring Framework plays one important role. So you can see a significant increase from 2012 to 2016 in the market, right? So if you can see, so Spring MVC is one of uh, the most, you know, interesting part over here. If you can see it has the maximum, uh, you know, respondents available. So let's see some job trends when it comes to Spring Framework. 
so in, in a country like india we have uh, somehow you know uh, demand right so it's it's like uh, more of demand in india and uh, if you can see various job portals so an approximate uh, average is uh, nearly 3000 right so in a similar way we got uh, the trends in us as well right so again so us is uh, approximately on, on an average level of uh, 6000 right so we we are trying to come up and show you guys that spring framework is really into the market and we got a lot of job openings available into the spring framework so this data is approximately 18th may 2017 so again if you can see uh, some more trends coming in so we got the permanent jobs versus the contract jobs right so the graph is rising so it's not falling off right so so as the years increase right so this graph is uh, constantly going up right it's it's not coming down so again uh, the data we have taken from you know uh, the various uh, job portals so let's see what we have gotten for the day so we will be discussing general questions with respect to the spring framework and we'll see the dependency injection and inversion of control right so here i'll try to demonstrate a couple of uh, concepts for you practically as well thereafter we'll see the beans in the spring framework how we can uh, you know rather than coming up with the configuration xml files we can use annotations then what is your data access layer where you can uh, integrate your jdbc or hibernate with the spring framework then we'll move on to aspect oriented programming and in the end we'll have one introduction to spring mbc so guys uh, let's uh, start with the first one that's like the spring framework now this is very basic question when you are going to start uh, with interview right so the technique so what do you know about spring framework or what exactly is spring framework now that's like the primary question which you might face so in an introductory part so what you can come up with is so it's a lightweight framework which basically focuses on loose coupling so when i say coupling it means a uh, less dependencies right and it's an integrated framework which is created to address the complexity of enterprise application development so majorly you are going to come up with the spring framework when you are writing an enterprise level application right and other than that it's a layered architecture so we can be selective about what and all components we wish to use right and uh, thereafter it's going to provide us a cohesive environment for our application development in Java Enterprise Edition. So let's see the advantages of Spring Framework, right? So what can be the various advantages if you wanna come up with a Spring Framework? So number one, it's a layered architecture. So here we got Bean, Model, or Tojo. That's like plain old Java object-based programming. Then there are two powerful features in the core layer of Spring Framework. That's like dependency injection and inversion of control. So we don't have the control in the hands of uh, our program. So uh, this uh, object, they will be created by the spring container, right? So inversion of control means you don't create the objects, you configure the objects and objects will be constructed by the spring framework. So again, it's an open source uh, community. So no vendors are coming in, no licensing coming in. So that's one of the major advantage of using any of the technology, right? Which is open source. Now coming on to the features, so it's lightweight, right? So when I say lightweight, it means we got memory optimizations. Then we got inversion of control. We got the control of object construction to the destruction. The entire life cycle will be managed by the spring container. We got aspect oriented programming, which is going to help us in writing the cross cutting concerns. For example, security. Then we got a built in container and we got mvc framework so we got a pre uh, you know available uh, snippet as in mvc so which is model view controller as a design pattern then we got transaction management and database uh, handling part right so jdbc etc and etc we can uh, do a lot of things in data access layer of our spring framework so let's see what and all are the modules available in the spring framework and what exactly they are right so guys spring framework is a layered architecture so it's it's basically a layered architecture so layers can interact with each other right so in the upper direction the lower direction so the uh, rock bottom layer is a testing layer that's like uh, you can have j unit testing or uh, you can have unit testing using j unit even you can have uh, integration uh, uh, testing right then we got the core container which contains the which is the core of the spring framework right 
So here we're gonna play with the beans, core, context, and spring expression language. Thereafter, we got AOP. That's like aspect-oriented programming. Then aspects, instrumentation, and uh, messaging. In the data access layer, we got uh, ORM. That's like object relationship mapping, right? And other tools are also available. And the web layer, we got uh, web socket, web framework, servlets, code. So it's basically a framework of frameworks now, right? So we got a lot of uh, frameworks available within a single framework. Now, one of the major thing, which is, uh, you know, a core of our Spring framework is the configuration file. Now, this is an XML file, right? Where we will be configuring the values for the attributes of an object, right? So where we are talking about inversion of control, you are supposed to configure your objects in an XML file. Spring container will read this Spring configuration file and will construct the objects for us. Now that's like inversion of control. So let us see the different components uh, available in the Spring application. So guys, we got an interface that will define the functions, right? The implementation that contains the properties like uh, uh, you can say a student is one, uh, you know, a kind of a class which contains the attributes like a role number, name, you know, standard, age, etc, etc, along with the getters, setters or any other methods, right? So we got aspect oriented programming and we got the spring configuration, which is an XML file and we need to have a client program where we gonna use our spring container and we'll be using the objects constructed by it, right? So that's like some various components of any spring application. So what are the major uh, versions for the spring framework? So guys, we got 2.5, right? So uh, this guy is, uh, you know, having annotation driven configuration, right? So which is possible in this 2.5. So before 2.5, uh, we, we were not having the annotational supports available. Then in 3.0, so the use of uh, Java uh, 5 improvements in the language, right? So we got some uh, enhancements in the language itself. So in 4.0, it's like the first version which fully supports all the Java features, right? So that's like uh, the latest version even in the market. So what are the various ways uh, how we can uh, use this spring framework right so the different ways of using the spring framework so we can have full fledged spring web application that's like through model view controller we can have a middle tier that can provide the help of a third party web framework then we can use it if we are supposed to uh, do any remote uh, you know invocations then we got enterprise java beans so wrapping up the existing uh, uh, plain old Java objects, right? So that's like some of the different ways in which we can come up with our Spring framework. So let's now focus on the core part of the Spring framework. That's like dependency injection and inversion of control, right? So what exactly is this IOC? So guys, inversion of control over here means that you don't create the objects objects will be constructed by the spring framework right and we got ioc container which will do so so we're gonna wire uh, the objects right we're gonna configure them in an xml file management of the entire life cycle from construction till destruction will be taken care by this guy ioc container we can also come up with dependency injection like features where we can punch in the dependent data or you can say that we got uh, a relationship like person has an address right so person is one object and address is the other object so having a dependency of uh, address object and person object um, you know on on each other we can come up with this dependency injection technique where we can fulfill this criteria, right? So it is basically for has a relation which has to be fulfilled. So what do you mean by dependency injection? So guys, DI over here means that we don't create objects, but describe how they should be created. Now that's like the basic inversion of control feature, right? So we don't directly connect the components and services in the code. So we need to come up with the configuration in the XML file itself, right? So uh, dependency injection is uh, done in your XML structure itself. So we got a container which is responsible 
for doing it right so we we got spring container which will do so so how many ways this dependency injection can be done so guys we got three different uh, ways of doing it we can have constructor based injection right so it means that you're gonna come up with constructors then we can have setter injection then we can also have interface injection so let's uh, try to see what exactly we are uh, you know uh, intending over here consider that you got one class as person right and persons person can have uh, one let's say id person can have an email then person can have uh, some age right and we can have uh, many other attributes right so these are the attributes for person now we got one more class known as address so when i'm going to come up with the address so address can have its own attributes so for example you can have a city right we can have one address line then you can also come up with some state right so you can have a country you can have a zip code so on and so forth right so these are the attributes available in my address now we need to come up with one relationship that person has an address so this is one has a relationship which we have created so person has an address so that is what we are trying to uh, come up with so guys when there is a has a relationship then we are talking of dependency so this is dependency now right so what we can do now we can have a person constructor where we can say address as in a new address right so let's let's uh, talk of very general thing and in some client class where we'll have this guy main method so i'm not writing i'm just trying to uh, do it in a pseudo way so let's say uh, we are going to come up and we are saying person p as in a new person right so i'm going to create one new person and when the constructor of the person will be executed at that time the object of address will be created it means that there exists a very high dependency that address object can be constructed only when the person object will be constructed so such a dependency is leading to very high coupling right so we got a concept where person object when it will be constructed only then the address object will be constructed so this is one problem statement and we need to find out the solution for this to find out the solution we will not do it like this we'll come down and we'll try to create one constructor and we'll pass one address and we'll say copy the a into address or what we will say we'll say let's create one setter like set address and here we can have an address as in a, right so this is what we would rather intend to do so benefit of this will become like you can say address a as in a new address and thereafter you can say p dot set the address as in a or in the other ways you can say person q as a new person and here in the constructor you can pass the guy a so this is like how you are resolving the dependency so address object is constructed separately person object is constructed separately so you can set the address either through a setter method or you can pass it as an input to the constructor as per your will so we are trying to come up with constructor injection and setter injection in the configuration file linked with these two key concepts right so we call this as dependency and here we have resolved the problem of high coupling we have reduced the coupling level and we call it like we have solved one problem where dependency was very high so let's now proceed and understand so either you can do it by constructor or setter or you can even do it through interfaces right so if you want to come up uh, with some polymorphic concept and if you want to come up with some you know runtime uh, uh, logics you can also uh, write interfaces so it's, it's going to be more flexible in our programs so what exactly is the difference i hope uh, one of the key concept is very well clear now so what is constructor and setter based uh, dependency resolution 
so in constructor there is no partial injection but in setter you can do a partial injection right so here we don't overwrite the setter property but here you need to come up with the setter property defined very well so it will create new instances if any modification is done right so here you can't come up without an object right so you need an object for sure but here you can skip that and you can do it later so it is better for too many properties and if we got few properties you can always use the setter injection right so these are some differences between constructor and setter injection all right so how many types of ioc containers are there in the spring framework so guys there are two major containers in the spring framework of uh, ioc layer so we got application context and bean factory right so guys the uh, bean factory is basically uh, one container right and application context is implementation and it's built on top of bean factory itself so it is always uh, better to come up with application context rather than the bean factory so let us uh, uh, try to differentiate between bean factory and application context and let's try to uh, write one program and see how we can do so right so let's see uh, one program so let's uh, create one new java project and i am going to name it like uh, my spring demo right so let's uh, say next and let's say finish so it's it's one project in java which i have created and within my src directory what i'm going to do i'm going to create one class and this class is going to go under the package go.edureka and since we are on to interview questions let's think of employee class right so let's say finish so here we are with the employee i am going to come up with one employee id right so that's like uh, the attributes then we can have a name of the employee i can have uh, some salary associated with the employee right let's say we got department for the employee and finally if you want you can have uh, uh, let's say an email right so we can have lot of attributes so these are a few of the attributes which i have uh, taken now we can create one constructor right so let's write one constructor so it's a uh, it's a default one so here i will just say see so employee object constructed right so let's say employee object constructed so coming up uh, with next i can write source and then getters and setters right so let's write getters and setters for our class so select all and say okay so here we are with the getters and setters and finally i will generate one two uh, two string method right so let's say a two string method so this is my employee class which is uh, written and we say that this is a pojo or bean or model right so you can uh, use any terminology right so pojo is a plain old java object let's come back and let's try to write one more class and here i am going to say a client class with the main method so in the client class with the main method so what is the traditional way of creating the objects or what is the you know a, a general way of creating the objects right so general way of creating the objects it goes like you say an employee e as in a new employee right so this is the reference to the employee object so i can say e ref dot set of uh, name for example it goes like john you say e ref dot set of let's say eid as 101 so guys uh, these are some regular ways of creating the objects right so eref dot let's say set of uh, department so i'm going to say it's like r and d then let's say set of salary which is like 45000 then you say eref dot set of email which goes like john at example.com now this is one traditional way or general way how we construct an object now if i say ciso of eref details 
plus e ref so if i print out the e ref it's going to call the two string method and here you will see let's run it as a java application so you will see it says employee object constructed and these are the details available in my employee object now this is one general way or traditional way how you construct the objects but we need to understand how the objects are constructed using the spring framework to do so the very first thing which i am going to do is i'm going to link the jar files right so how i will do that i will do right click and i will say build path and i will say configure my build path right so when i say configure the build path i will be my libraries and i'm going to say add external jars so let's add the spring jars so guys i got uh, this uh, spring jars available over here so we need to add the core layer jars right so i'm using the spring core over here so i'm going to add these core jar files and then say apply and you can say okay so here you can see the referenced jars available for your spring framework now the next part is to come up with some xml configuration file in your src directory to do so so what i am going to do i have it with me so let me open that so i am uh, here with this employee bean.xml so going to copy this xml file and i'm going to paste it in my src directory so point to be noted is that this is pasted in src directory but not in the package so in my src directory this employee bean.xml it looks like this so it's it's basically one xml configuration file the root tag is beans and we got uh, the tag as bean so i'm going to say bean id is e1 and class is co dot edureka dot employee so fully qualified uh, a name of my class it comes up like co dot edureka dot employee and the id is e1 now we got few properties uh, available over here eid name salary department and email right so let's start with eid so we got eid then you got name salary department and email right so eid name salary department and email so we got eid name salary department and email so i have mentioned this property so what are the values which you want to a uh, set into them so i will say one or two the name goes like jenny and salary goes like let's say somewhere around 50000 department is hr and email is jenny at example.com right so here we are guys so now uh, you can configure as many as objects you want in your xml file so let's configure one more let's say the id is e2 now the id should be unique right so this id goes like uh, 201 and the name goes like uh, george so george is uh, having a 57000 and this guy belongs to admin and let's say the email id goes like george at example.com right so this is one of the configuration files which uh, we must have in our spring project right so what we got we got a pojo class we got a configuration file we got the jar files and we got a client class to test our program so let's see the spring way so the spring way goes like with the help of a concept known as inversion of control right so what exactly is this term inversion of control so guys in inversion of control i am going to give this right to my spring container so let's see the first container so i'm going to say the first container over here as bean factory so let's see how to use this guy bean factory first of all i'll come up with one api known as resource from a uh, spring framework right if it's from the spring framework you say resource resource as in a new class path resource and here i will say my employee bean dot xml so this is your xml configuration file right so if you can see over here so this xml configuration file it goes into the class path resource and there after you say bean factory 
and let's say factory as in a new XML being factory from the resource. So guys, this is how we uh, use our first guy that's like being factory, right? So this is my first container. So it's a spring IOC container. So what's being factory? It's a spring IOC container. So this guy is responsible to construct objects for us. Now, I'm just going to run the code. So when I run the code, so nothing happens, uh, just this relevant information is displayed. Now what we need to observe over here. So when I'm executing the code, Spring Framework, the container, that's like bean factory, is not constructing an object for us. But as soon as I will say, employee m1 as in factory dot get the bean on the basis of e1, right? So here if you can see, we got the guy as e1, right? And uh, you need to typecast it back to the employee. So when you call its method get bean, at that very instance, now when I'm going to run the code, right? So you can see employee object constructed. Only one object is constructed, right? So if you try to get the second guy as in E2, and when you run the code again, you will find that both the objects are constructed. So bean factory, what it is doing? It constructs the objects when we request that's like the spring ioc container bean factory so it constructs the object when we request now you can uh, just say a CSO on amp1 as well as amp2 right so here we are so let's run the code and you can see the details coming in so guys this is the first bean factory as in your ioc container right so let's see the second guy that's like application context so it's also a spring framework container right and let's see how it's gonna come up so it constructs the objects even when we do not request so let's see how how it's gonna do so so i'll comment out the above code and let's see the application context in action so I'll say application context, context as in a new class path XML application context. And here you mention this guy employee bean dot XML. Now it is uh, very much equivalent to whatever we have done before. Now I'm just going to run the code, right? So when I run the code, I can see both the employee objects are constructed even though I have not requested for any object. Now that's one of the significant difference which you can see over here, right? As in the practical environment. So if uh, you don't request, even then it's going to create. And if you are trying to request, so you request it in the same way. So the way you were requesting it before. So guys, uh, if you don't want to typecast it over here, you can just come down and you can say comma employee dot class, right? So you can mention the type over here. So that's the second way. So both the cases, it's going to work, right? So you can mention it over here even, right? And you can uh, just leave this from this side. So uh, here again, so both the concepts, uh, they're going to give you the same outcome, but the object construction, if you can see, right? Application context will construct the objects even if you don't request for them. Uh, that's like uh, one practical example how we are able to demonstrate both the concepts so uh, let's see more of the differences between both of them so that was a quick introduction to the spring framework right uh, what is uh, inversion of control so guys being packed in application context uh, so here we got lazy initialization and there we got aggressive initialization now that relevant concept i think is very well clear whatever we have demonstrated so in uh, being factory explicitly provided a resource object using the syntax where here every resources are managed by its own so internationalization is not supported in bean factory whereas application context does so application annotation based uh, dependency injection is not supported by bean factory whereas application context will support now that's also one of the major differences so uh, some of the benefits of ioc so guys ioc will minimize the amount of code in application because you will have uh, one XML configuration file. So anytime if you want to change, 
so you can change the configuration right so it's very easy to test our application and coupling can be you know uh, reduced so it can be a loose coupling concept which we can promote and hence there will be least intrusive mechanisms with minimal efforts right so ioc containers they gonna support eager instantiation and lazy loading kind of services for you let's see now what are spring beans so guys a uh, uh, bean is nothing it's your java object which we have seen already in our program right so the metadata is provided in the xml file container will create an object for you so that's like your basic bean object so this configuration metadata can be given in an xml file it can also be supplied through an annotation based configuration or it can be even a java based configuration so uh, there are three uh, uh, main models how you can configure your objects as in your ioc concept now what can be the various uh, scopes which can be supported by the spring framework so what is meant by this scope right so let's try to understand this part so guys our scope over here means when you are writing your employee bean right so here you can mention a scope so scope can go like a single ton which means for your entire application there will be only single object scope can go like a prototype so by default it is single ton right so when you say prototype every time a new object will be constructed for you so uh, if you want to see a difference let's see one difference right so i'm i'm going to say the scope is a single ton in my client so i'm going to work on e1 right so in my employee.java so here in the two string method i'm going to say plus super dot two string right so i'll, I'll put one backslash n and i will say object address super dot two string so in my client when i'm going to run the code you will also find that uh, all right so i think i didn't printed it so let's say uh, CSO of amp1, right? So when I'm going to say amp1, so it, it will now say the address is 21BCFFD5, right? So there is one object which is constructed at this memory location. Now let us try to write one amp2, which is uh, again, we are requesting E1, right? So you are requesting only E1. So again, I'm going to print amp2. And now you'll find that both of the objects are same right you can see the address so that is where we got the guy as single time let's change this to prototype so i'm going to change it to prototype now let's read on the code and here now you will find that this is a separate address and this is a separate address so that's like the scopes within your beans right so scope when your beans can be singleton prototype request session or a global session request is for one http request session is throughout one http session and global session is valid in the context of a web aware spring application context right so what is the bean life cycle so guys we also have a life cycle of a bean right so what does this mean now spring framework you got this entire life cycle management happening by the spring ioc container itself so the beans gonna get instantiated then its property is gonna get populated through setter methods right so setter methods are going to get called right and any post processor if you want to come up you got a bean post processor api so we can have after properties being set and custom in it and custom destroy can also be implemented like we have seen my init and my destroy so we can also have a post initialization like we got a post processor over here and once the bean is ready to use you can use it and once container is shut down so custom destroy method is executed so what are inner beans so guys inner beans are like uh, if, if you have a person right has a relationship in student right so you can come up with the inner bean so you can have a bean property and then you can also create one inner bean and you can set its properties over here so what is bean wiring so guys uh, bean wiring is uh, something right uh, which means that beans are combined together with the spring container so when we are wiring the beans the spring container must know what beans are required and how the container should use dependency injection to tie them together right so what are the different uh, modes to wire uh, the beans so guys we got uh, by number by name by type constructor and auto detect so these are the different ways through which you can bind them 
so what can be the limitations if you are going to come with auto wiring so guys uh, the possibility of overriding is there right and then primitive data types it becomes complicated it's challenging and it's again confusing in nature right so you need to remember what was the name over there and what has to be kept over here right so it's a bit confusing all right so we got spring annotations so guys the way we got uh, xml configuration in a similar way we can have annotation right so you can uh, mention at the rate configuration or at the rate bean so these are the different annotational based configurations for your spring ioc container so how we can come up with the annotation wiring so if you are supposed to come up with annotation wiring you must support context colon annotation config uh, you must write this uh, property in your xml file right so how you can do so so you need to come up over here and you need to say context colon annotation config so if you are going to support uh, uh, your annotations you must follow the standard all right so let's now see what are exactly uh, the different annotations which are quite used in commercial or in industry so we got component controller repository and service so these are uh, you know a kind of uh, most used annotations so guys component is basically a generic stereotype right which can be used across uh, the application controller is to represent your business part service will uh, annotate classes on the service level layer and repository is going to deal with the database part so what is this at the rate required annotation so guys uh, when we are coming up with the um, uh, bean construction at the rate required is a kind of you can say a uh, one constraint right so, so name has to be populated for sure else it's gonna throw a bean initialization exception so that's like uh, you can say putting up the constraints so at the rate auto wired annotation is basically auto wiring right so let's say you got an employee right and uh, we got this guy name so you can put it as in at the rate auto wire so auto wiring uh, here by name so you need not to come up with a different dependency injection technique you need to use the same name so what is this guy qualifier so guys there are some situation when uh, you gonna create more than one beam for the same type but we want to wire only any one out of them with a property so we can use qualifier annotation along with auto wiring so that we can remove this ambiguous nature right so qualifier is used so that you can mention which bean is supposed to be auto wired right in case you have uh, multiple constructions for the same guy now we got request mapping annotation so this annotation is particularly for your http request now we are trying to come uh, something known as the web part of the spring framework so at the rate request mapping annotation it can be applied at both the levels so class level and method level so in class level method it's going to map the url request whereas on the method level it's going to also take care of http method right so http method can be either get post delete put trace any methods right so these methods can be taken care so let's see what is the data access here so guys uh, spring comes with the data access uh, support right so we got all DAO as a design pattern uh, concept which can be you know uh, used off in our spring framework so spring framework uh, data access is uh, aimed at making it easy to work with the data access technologies like hibernate ibatis jdbc or jdo right java data objects so it's it's very easy to switch between the persistent technology so you can switch from one of the framework to the other framework very easily so code without worrying about catching the exceptions that are specific to each technology so you can write a very beautiful independent code so what are the various exceptions so guys we got data access exception as the root right so there are various subclasses to this exception now so if you can see there there is uh, one whole hierarchy in a similar way the basic code java concept if you talk about the standard edition you got throwable coming out uh, with exception and then you are having a complete exception hierarchy as in runtime exceptions check versus unchecked etc etc so here we got a complete hierarchy coming in right so you need not to remember that but you should always remember that there exists one paid exception class so uh, what and all classes are present in the spring jdbc api so guys we got jdbc template simple jdbc template named parameter jdbc template 
so we got a simple jdbc insert simple jdbc call so these are some major important apis with respect to your jdbc so jdbc template is again uh, used on a very frequent basis so how we can use hibernate and uh, uh, spring framework so guys there are two ways so either you can do an inversion of control with the hibernate template api or you can extend the hibernate dao support and you can use aop that's like aspect oriented programming so what are the types of transactions uh, uh, transaction management right uh, types which spring framework supports so guys there are two things one is programmatic transaction management and declarative transaction management so many times uh, you as a developer might be confused over here so transaction is managed with the help of programming in programmatic transaction management so here we got an extreme flexibility right but maintenance is a bit difficult part but in declarative part so transaction management is not a part of your programming so it's basically annotations or xml based configuration to manage your transaction now that's the core difference so declarative means either annotational based or xml based so different orms uh, are supported by the spring framework right so that right, all of the major orms right any relationship uh, mapping for the object framework so most importantly we got hibernate and ibatis uh, which are you know use even jpa is also one of the core concept so now let's see spring aop so guys aop stands for aspect oriented programming now this is one technique which allows the programmers to modularize cross cutting concerns so what is meant by the cross cutting concern we'll see in our upcoming uh, slides so we can also modularize the behavior that's going to cut across the typical divisions of responsibility now the core construct of the aop is known as an aspect right so which encapsulates different behaviors affecting multiple classes into some reusable modules so we got a base or a core program we got an aspect and there after you going to weave them together to get a final system right so let's try to understand it in more detail what exactly is this guy aspect so guys an aspect is basically a modularization of a concern that cuts across multiple objects right so we got a source method and a target method so when we are going to call the method so this aspect will have one point cut and one joint cut so what is this guy concern so guys for example security is one concern right so that's like uh, fulfilled by aspect so let's uh, see what is this uh, join point so when you are going to execute a method so if you can see in the method execution you got various join points right so a point during the execution of program such as the execution of a method or handling of any exception right it is known as a join point so in spring aop a join point always represents a method execution right so any point in the method execution is referred to as a join point so advice is something which is an action taken by an aspect at any particular join point right so for any uh, particular join point we got an advice right within an aspect so there can be around before and after so what happens uh, before the method execution what happens after the method execution what happens around the method execution right so let's try to take one uh, example over here if you are going to log into the amazon right so you 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 are going to come up with one request so at what time you going to log in so that's like uh, before right and what time you log out that's like the after so you take it like one method execution as one interval where you are surfing around the amazon and that's like around right so that's one key example so many aop frameworks we got model and advice as an interceptor and we need to maintain various chain of interceptors around the join point so let's see the different advices so we got before and uh, after right so this is like uh, coming up uh, before the method execution and after the method execution so similarly we got around the method execution we got after returning and after throwing as well so this is uh, quite linked with exceptions now so let's point out the difference between concern and cross cutting concern so guys uh, what is a concern concern is a behavior we want to have in a module of an application whereas a cross cutting concern is a concern which is applicable throughout the application for example security 
from writing your code to maintenance to execution you need the security on every level right so that's like your cross cutting concern so what exactly are the different aop implementations so guys right, we got uh, spring aop apache aspect j and jboss aop so these are the various uh, aop implementations available in the market so let's uh, uh, differentiate between spring aop and aspect j aop so guys spring aop we got weaving through proxy right here uh, we got uh, a uh, weaving through aspect j within the java tools so aop in the spring will support only method level point cut whereas uh, in aspect j aop even the field level point cuts are also possible so we got uh, dtt based so it's like document type definition right and uh, aspect j is a uh, schema based or annotational configuration again so what is this proxy all about so guys what happens whenever you create an object so after applying an advice to a target object right so in respect to the client objects any target and the proxy object they are the same so you got an advice and you got a target object so in overall you get a proxy right so that's like uh, what the proxy is intended to so what is meant by this guy being whenever an aspect is going to be linked with application types or any object which has to be created as an advice object so this particular concept we call it as weaving right so this can be performed on three instances either at compilation time or at run time or even at the time of loading right so guys in spring framework when you are doing the weaving performance weaving process it is performed always at run time right so you need to call up uh, for your proxy for your target and this particular weaving will be taken care at run time so it's all dynamic so lastly we got spring mvc that's like uh, model view controller so guys the spring mvc framework helps us to work in a predefined model view controller architecture so we got ready to use components which will help us to develop flexible and loosely coupled web application so we got different aspects of the application which are separated now so you can see over here we got dispatcher servlet as one of the key important ingredient we got the mapping handler mapping controller view resolver and view so these are the various components let's see what are these guys so guys dispatcher servlet is the one which will handle any http request or response so spring mvc framework is designed around the dispatcher servlet only so what is this web application context so web application context is uh, again an extension of application context so application context is the core container whereas web application context is a container on the web app layer right so this will have an extra feature for your web applications so it is also capable of resolving some themes and it knows which servlet is associated to which kind of resource right so that's like your web application context so what is this guy controller so guys controller is going to act as a receptionist so whenever any new request will come from the user it will go to the controller and thereafter controller is going to process the data from the model and then it's going to give the view back to the user right so spring controller is going to act as a receptionist now right where it's going to handle your requests so that's like the whole agenda for the day so guys if you are going to come up with any spring interview right you need to follow these topics you need to prepare these topics so that you can crack your interviews right so that's all from uh, uh, my side and edureka so we wish you all the very best and we hope that you do well in your interviews so thank you very much keep watching us and uh, keep reviewing us so once again thank you very much so this is ishan on behalf of edureka i hope you have enjoyed the session all the best rise and shine thank you very much guys bye bye i hope you have enjoyed listening to this video please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to edureka channel to learn more happy learning